I'm Shauna Hagen, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft, and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. So, Ilya, guess what we're doing right now? Uh, We're on episode 42. Holy crap. The episode about... The answer to the great question of life, the universe, and everything. Well done. Verbatim. You you, you pulled that right out. I have read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy several times. Have you seen the movie? I have. Did you see the TV series? I did. Did you see the remake of the TV series? I did not. Oh, that one's good too. I uh, also, I believe there was a radio show and early in my, in my personal computing life, and I'm talking like Late, late 80s. Yeah. There was a text only adventure Ooh. game. Oh, I played that game. It yeah. was really cool. Yeah, it was it was tough though. So that's more yakety yak than anyone should ever listen to at the beginning of a podcast. <laughs> um, Episode 42 is a long way of so, getting to that. Yeah. And we also we didn't introduce ourselves. I am Ben Rock. I'm Ilya Friedman. And uh, Ilya, you told me that we have some fan mail or something you know what this is kind of the the wonderful thing about having alana as our producer uh she has somehow uh increased our numbers so much now that people are voluntarily without us twisting their arms leaving us awesome five-star reviews what all all over uh the uh, the interwebs the itunes the instagrams let me just uh let me just read off a couple of these here uh this first one uh comes from e gusualdo Igusaldo. If I screwed that up, I'm so sorry, but that's what it looks like. And he calls our show a staple exclamation point, five stars. This podcast is hands down the best podcast for any DP to listen to if they enjoy hearing firsthand from the pros who have paved the way before them. I've gained so much perspective and the hosts are truly engaging. That's that's very that's high praise. I that, feel like an, a, a baby alligator laying on its back, having its belly rubbed. Thank that, you. That was that was that was a baby alligator. Well, you are from Florida, I am. so yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, then. Uh, this person's name is Bobbert J D. A really enjoyable trip with some awesome DPs. I enjoy getting to hear how they get started and how they develop their process. Thank you very much. Great insight. Five stars. We're all about the process here. Thank you, Bobbert. Uh, here, here's another one. Uh, easy to get lost. Five stars from Noah from Pennsylvania. I love the cinematography podcast. It's probably the most interesting thing I listen to. That being said, I often get so inspired by the interviews that I find myself drifting off into my own ideas of films I can make, often missing half the interview and needing to rewind. Please make one of those films and then tell us that that it was in, that it came up while you were listening to. Uh, I'm going to go with Russell Carpenter. I don't know why. Well, uh, you know, uh, Noah from Pennsylvania, thank you very much. I re- we really appreciate the review. Uh, here's two more really quickly. Lou in Chicago writes, a great interview of the greats. Just listen to the Carpenter interview, which was fascinating. As a side note, I wondered to myself about the connection between director and animals. Woo and doves, Leon and dogs. You, you know what, what he's talking about, right? Yeah. Animals and, yeah, and their directors. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. John Woo and Doves, Leon yes. and Dog, Sergi Leon. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, yes. Sorry. I, <laughs> I, I, you I, gave me this look like, what? <laughs> no, I, 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 my brain went to a different place. Actually, <laughs> I was drifting off imagining a movie I would make while in while listening to us record this, which is really meta. Okay, so so here is possibly uh, possibly the, the best review of this recent batch. Oh, um, I'm strapping in right now. All right, this is from Soft Boxer. Uh, he <laughs> soft boxer wrote, uh, five stars and he wrote such good info. Hey, exclamation point. I've been tuning in for the last year and it's always a great day when you release a new episode. I've learned a ton of relevant info and have been blown away by the stories of how these DPs made it to where they are. However, Sweet. yeah, wait, hold your horses. Wait, here's the, here's the best part. However, more recently, Ben has been interviewing people less and less. I know he had a baby, swear jar. Yeah, seriously, buddy. <laughs> no offense, Ilya. Ben is better at interviewing. Oh, come on. He, he goes more in-depth and seems less in a hurry to wrap things up. Okay. Ben, please, please interview more. I wouldn't mind waiting longer in between episodes if that means the interview is longer and higher quality. If not possible, maybe you could... Uh, there's more. He wrote a lot here. Oh, man. You, you could do a longer listener question question section or have a bunch of pre-written 
uh, questions ready to go so we get more from your guests. Nothing personal. I effing love the podcast and will continue to listen forever. Okay, I just want to say something in your defense. No, no, that was you. You wrote this. I know you're actually softboxer. I am not (laughs) softboxer. I, uh, if you know me as uh, in, in my shooting, I prefer hard light. Anyway, um, <laughs> you find a Chimera in my garage yeah, and I will you, give you a hundred thousand dollars. You won't find it. Yeah. So, uh, no, uh, I just want to say something in, in your defense, Ilya, is that a lot of the interviews you did were done at camera image and you didn't have a lot of time to do them. We had very, very short windows with some people. Not not all of them were camera homage, but uh, I have had a series of interviews that I conducted where people were on the run. Also, you were at Sundance. Yeah. And Sundance and other places yeah, like yeah. that where so, it was like... So honestly, you've been doing so much heavy lifting on this show, especially while I've uh, you know been, uh, I, I want to say recovering, but I guess, yeah, I'm going to go with it. Recovering from having a baby. I didn't have to have the baby. Yeah. My wife had the baby. <laughs> she had all the physical you know, stuff you, to you recover had the, from. You had the recovering after. But, but I had yeah. like the year of like re-engaging my my life 15 long months of of uh like i feel like a tourist in my own life right now well so uh uh, but i will say i have returned to interviewing i've conducted probably like five or six interviews in the last couple of months uh i'm not offended by soft boxer at all and uh, i actually feel like uh, i'm not offended i just i just i think you do very good interviews and i you know oh you you don't you don't have to defend me my my skin is thick but uh, i will also say that i hadn't really ever conducted interviews uh before doing this and mine sort of came a bit later from yours anyway so i think i'm a bit better now than when i I first started out but yes you you get to hear all my my early mistakes did i ever tell you the first person i ever interviewed for anything the first interview I ever conducted. No training. I, I did not go to journalism school. I don't have a background in interviewing. Was it an elected official? It was not. Who was it? It was Errol fucking Morris. Oh, good job. So uh, my friend Janelle, who you know, Janelle oh, yeah, Riley, Janelle, yeah. was writing for Backstage and the fog of war was coming out. Oh, yeah. And they needed somebody who who would do this, do it for free, <laughs> who would interview <laughs> Errol Morris about the fog of war, which he went on to win the Oscar for, the Academy Award That's for right. uh, Best Documentary. And she's like, you're a fan of Errol Morris, right? And I was like, yeah. She's like, have you ever done an interview? I'm like, nope. She's like, would you do? Would you interview Errol Morris for free? And I was like, oh, you bet your fucking sweet ass I'll go interview Errol Morris for free. <laughs> and I'll shine his shoes. Yes. So I mean, like. <laughs> Wash his car. Like, he got the level, laundry. <laughs> the level of nerdiness that I have around Errol Morris is pretty high. Uh, I went there. I had, I'd seen the fog of war. I had a legal pad with probably 20 questions on it. I had. I think it was 30 minutes with him. It was in a hotel room. It was like the Beverly Hills hotel or something. And they had set up a junket and it was just me and him. I brought two recorders cause I was afraid one would fail. Good, and, good plan. Actually, backup is good. I went in arm for bear, all these questions. I sat down, he started talking. No, no questions. He just started talking. I think I asked one question in the middle. I think I had like one mild redirect and he talked for like 40 straight minutes and uh and it was just fascinating and uh you know i mean the first interview i ever conducted was with uh, for real one of my heroes he he had uh, fast cheap and out of control to this day is probably one of my favorite documentaries ever made but he made a brief history of time he made thin blue line he made you know, so many and, and this is before fog of war and the unknown known and and, and the stuff that he's maybe better known for now um, you know, uh, Mr. Death, like I, his, his movies were like appointment to go see in the theater kind of movies for me from as far back as I can remember. Well, uh, you got to meet one of your, your heroes then, yeah. uh, and first time out. And how, how do you think you did then compared to like the interviews you're doing now? Well, here's the thing. I, uh, I had read interviews with Errol Morris where they talked about his interviewing technique and his interviewing technique is just to get people talking and let them talk their themselves silly and then don't hit him with another question. Just wait for them to start talking again. And he feels like you get some of the most interesting stuff like out of that. I will say, I don't really have, uh, the, uh, the, the, the spine of, 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 of stone that it would take to like sit here with Russell Carpenter and just let a minute of silence pass between us before he started talking again. However, I, th- I think that what I took from that is my job is to listen and to not interject my personality into the circumstance. Like I'm not here when I'm interviewing, you know, whoever it is. I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to impose my personality on, on Sal Totino or, you know, check out what I say or whatever. I'm here to elicit responses from them. And I feel like in that way, Errol Morris was kind of my, 
North Star when it comes when it comes to interviewing. So it was weird that that was the first one I ever did. Speaking of documentarians, yes, uh, that that took us a while to get here, but uh, we've got Shauna Hagen on the show today. Shauna Hagen is amazing. I'm yeah. so excited that we got to have her on. If you are wa- listening to the sound of my voice right now and don't think you know who Shauna Hagen is, you do. You just don't know. You do. You've probably seen tons of stuff that she's shot. Yeah, she's she has done a lot of documentary work, especially and reality TV work. Tons. Uh, I met Shauna Hagen. 16 17 years ago uh my very like probably in my first week of working in rentals and i'd spent pretty much my entire career up until that point working in film and very very little in video and uh i i got i got this message i got this note that came to my desk it was like oh there's there's someone on the prep bay right now and they're asking a bunch of questions and we don't know the answers and maybe you can help her and i went okay and i went out there and shauna hagan took me to school shauna hagan uh taught me in like 15 minutes, all these things that I had, no, I had no idea about and made me realize it was like, I was at the, the first peak of the Dunning Kruger chart, you know, the, the, oh, no. the yeah, the, the, the hill of ignorance. And it was you like were that person. I was cause I knew film film was what I knew. I did not know digital, not at least not that well. I knew it a little, I, I went to high school. Was and, it even digital yet? At yeah, that you're point. right. It was, it was four by three. It was tape based. It, and she came and she's like, Hey, I need a switchable lens and this lens isn't switchable. And I'm like, what the fuck is switchable? What do you mean switchable lens? And she's like, switchable lens, 16 by nine. This is video and it's 16 by nine. You need a switchable lens. And I'm like, you're speaking Greek to me right now. And I thought I knew a few things. And then Shauna broke it all down. And I was so grateful. It was yeah, great. She's a, I, actually, uh, my wife, Alicia, uh, had shot with her, I believe on house hunters, but it might not have been house hunters. It might've been one of the other HGTV shows that Alicia has worked on over the years. That was probably some time ago, but a very long time ago. Cause she's been out of the field for about five years, you know, show producing. Uh, but yeah, Shauna, Shauna shot on, uh, on the apprentice with our current president. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that yeah. in no way is a comment on her work. Uh, also fear factor. I used yeah. to supply all the gear to fear factor once upon a time. So it's amazing. Anyway, uh, uh, and uh, I feel like she's got an amazing story to tell. Some of the some of her thoughts about documentary are amazing and nuanced. And I'm not going to talk about. It. I'm going to let her talk. Uh, by the way, we should say we're chipping away at the vault of stuff we did before I became a dad, which has been 15 months now. And you guys probably do not talk about this in the interview, but uh, currently on Netflix is Ugly Delicious. I know she's shooting some of that too. Awesome. So uh, I'm not going to talk any further about this. Here is Shauna Hagen. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Shauna Hagen, thank you very much for coming down. It's great to have you here. So I always start with the, my, my first question for every cinematographer, just to kind of kick off the, the whole topic of, of cinematography, is sort of the, uh, I'll reduce it to composition versus lighting. Uh, I believe that some DPs approach thing, things from a lighting standpoint, and I think some approach them from a composition standpoint. And I even believe that when they're reading the script, they're seeing the way it's going to look or they're seeing the shots as they're going to unfold. You can question the very nature of my of, of my question. Uh, but where do you stand? Like when you read a script, what's the thing that pops out to you? Or, uh, um, what's the first thing that pops out to you? Absolutely. Um, composition for, for uh, definitely. I, I have to say too that I shoot mostly documentaries. So my scripted work is actually quite limited. So um, in the features that I've done, it's all visualized. I'm constantly reading. When I read the script, I, I start to see uh, visuals instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, and also how to, tell, how, how to tell the story visually. I mean, in my documentary work, you're, you're essentially composing and lighting kind of on the fly, which I really love. We can get into that more later but oh we will um yeah um but definitely composition <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know if maybe that doesn't apply to me because i don't do a ton of scripted stuff but you know i was well, four, four seasons on parks and rec and all yeah. that stuff so but i you know even that was sort of a, a improvisational kind of documentary style too so well you know. um maybe this is something a lot of people don't know as much about because we're all used to reading screenplays or finding screenplays or talking to screenwriters but documentaries often are intricately planned from a visual standpoint i mean a documentary could be anything from you know frederick wiseman's titicut follies where you're we're just following inmates around like he's finding lighting wherever he goes sure. all the way to 
Errol Morris's Wormwood, which is, you know, <laughs> like deeply composed and deeply pre-produced and deeply, deeply, deeply lit and shot and, and everything. Very intentional and, and yeah, completely planned out. When when you say that you primarily work in the documentary space, like where do you like what's what's the what are your marching orders generally? And and how do you come up with a visual plan for a documentary? Right. Well, there's it's sort of twofold. One is, you know, I, I'm usually approached because of my past work. You know, I feel like in my documentary work, you know, I've been shooting for 25 years and I have a certain style, a certain aesthetic, a certain kind of sensitivity that I bring to my work. Um, and I think that shows in in the pieces that I've done. And people see my work and they kind of uh, want me to kind of bring that to the table when when I'm hired. So there's, two, there's twofold. I'm hired usually on the basis, again, of my work and my aesthetic. And then what I love about shooting documentaries is that each documentary is completely unique in its visual approach in that most of the time, the kinds of documentaries that I do, say, for example, I'll bring this up a lot. And one of my favorite documentaries that I've shot was a film called Shakespeare Behind Bars. Mm -hmm. It was a film that we did in the early 2000s. Actually, Ilya, um, I think we rented the gear from you um, for that film (laughs) at at Moviola Digital. From Um, a company that shall not be named. Shall not be named. It was Um, Moviola. (laughs) <laughs> in any case, we shot it in the uh, early 2000s. It was a film about a group of sh- uh, inmates at a prison in Kentucky that do Shakespeare. We were there for about a week, a month, um, for o- about a year, um, kind of shooting. And uh, that film really, week after week, the, the, every month that we were there for a week, we would continually hone our kind of visual themes. Like they kind of arose from the Verite shooting that we were doing. We documented their uh, rehearsals, um, as well as some of the guys on the yard, like we'd start to realize who our sort of breakout characters were, some mm-hmm. of the, the main cast. They, were, they did The Tempest the year we were there, which is fantastic, because if you know the story of The Tempest, it's based on an island, right? So there's automatic prison metaphors where people oh, yeah. are isolated, and the themes, general themes of that play um, are you know forgiveness, redemption, so it's a perfect play for histor- you know, telling a story um, you know with prisoners as the, as, you know, the actors. And in any case, uh, sort of approaching that stylistically and sort of discovering visual themes, um, we talked about sort of trying to visualize redemption, visualize, you know, forgiveness, and it sort of came up in reflections. Mm -hmm. So physically reflections, you know, anytime we saw a physical reflection in any environment, but be it on a TV screen or in a puddle on the ground or, you know, in a mirror, anything, even just a glimpse of reflection, um, we tried to incorporate that in our story. So, you know, that's a a, a broad example of sort of this visual theme that that developed over weeks and weeks. But oftentimes you you don't really go in knowing how you're going to shoot something. And that's what I I think I love about shooting documentaries is because it's there's such a sort of improvisational quality to it that you're just kind of discovering what your story is and then how do you um, thematically then help tell that story through these sort of larger visual themes. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but you're making perfect sense. Okay, honestly, it's it, most of the stuff that I do now is this sort of this style of documentaries where one doesn't really know. I mean, you have a broad sense of what the story is, but you don't really know what the characters are. You don't really know who the characters are. So in the shooting, you're discovering the characters. You're discovering their what they're about, their story. And so then you only after you discover them and spend time with them on camera and in, and then in person, kind of what those visual themes can be. You know, I'm working on a film now called uh, We Conduct about a female um, conductor mm-hmm. in Baltimore. Um, like a, and, an orchestra conductor? Uh, yes, or like a, a symphonic conductor. Oh, yeah. Her name's like, Amanda it Kinnan. could either be that or a train. <laughs> <laughs> no, a female uh, symphonic conductor named Marin Alsup, and she's the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. We have a couple of stories, too, that we're following um, with some kids in, in, uh, in an orchestra after-school program uh, in uh, inner city Baltimore. It's pretty cool, called Orc Kids. Anyway, you know, we shot for about two weeks last last summer, did a sizzle reel, and now we're starting back up. We've done maybe another six, week of sh- six weeks of shooting. We have another six weeks ahead of us. Wow. But there's constantly, like, this sort of... We, we, we came into this film knowing that music and, and how music affects our lives and how art and music is so important to so many people's lives. I mean, everything. It's it's now it's become uh, a film about sort of an artist at work. You know, uh, I love shooting stories about like artists at work. You know, the the act of creation, the act of of doing something, making something, creating something um, is is pretty remarkable. From a you know, I've done everything from painters painting to mm-hmm. like you know to uh, surgeons doing their thing. You know, I, I just love people watching people do what they do best. Um, but stylistically, again, it's sort of disco- it's discovered along the way. I mean, that's the, again the most exciting part for me in a documentary is that you're not quite sure where the story will lead nor mm-hmm. where, like, where the character will bring you. But I think being open to going with it 
and having this sort of loose visual theme that you've got, like so with the We Conduct project, it's uh, it's all about sort of how music is all around us. You know, people sort of tapping their t- tapping their fingers in time. Or we were shooting a, some B roll, and magically this guy who had a kids, um, what do you call the the plinkety plinks uh, that like the block xylophone and, no glockenspiel. Oh. It's like a yeah, a little mini xylophone. It's like a kid xylophone, but he's like a street musician. He's like the sixty year old sort of maybe homeless guy, but he's playing music literally. Mm-hmm. And he was classically trained as a pianist, but he's like shooting. So we had this amazing B roll sequence outside our the Peabody Institute where we're shooting in, in Baltimore, and um, he you know he just happened to be there, kind of rolling through town, and he didn't really know what building he was sitting in front of, but um, it just sort of we were there, we shot it. It's a beautiful sequence. We did a little you know sort of on the fly interview with him but um but music is all around us that's the theme of this particular um film it's challenging again for me to just on a side note to talk about certain like errol morris and like mm. um what's his name bob uh bob chappelle is that right his uh his his dp that's done like fog of war and all this oh crap. so those those know, like robert richardson shot a bunch of Richard, those yeah richardson and like then he shot fast cheap and out of control in parts of mr death and then there was a dp whose name i don't recall who shot a few and then on wormwood ellen curris shot shot the uh, reenactments right one of the reasons i like shooting docs is the improvisational nature of it. I think there's never, certainly never that there's the same thing twice, but you mm-hmm. can use things that you've learned, not only shooting scripted stuff. I mean, I've done a fair amount. I've done, gosh, I've done uh, features and, and commercials and... Uh, yeah, you've done and, and, like a lot of everything. Reality <laughs> and, and nonfiction TV yeah. and uh, and a lot of, you know, even scripted half-hour comedies, Parks and Recreation and, you know, tons of documentaries. And I think every bit of my work on any different genre always informs my work on the other genres. So there's you know, say like I'm in a documentary uh, and I'm just, you know, rolling into a cafe with some people and an, a beautiful afternoon light that sort of evokes a certain mood and we just happen to be there at a fantastic time. When I get into a scripted environment, I want to kind of recreate that moment. You know, yeah. if I if have the time and the energy and the crew to do it, you know, I want to sort of recreate that mood that, that that lighting evokes. So it's really interesting how my work on certain genres can inform my work on the other genres. Well, and there's an sense. obvious straight line between your documentary work and something like Parks and Rec which is kind of a funny take on a doc, you know, in a similar way to like The Office. Um, but that stuff is obviously loosely scripted, I'm assuming. But when, when you're doing uh, the, the kind of doc work that you're doing, like how much preparation and thought do you put into, say, interviews that you're going to do? Mm-hmm. Do you work up some kind of a style guide? Absolutely. Or do yeah. you like, well, take me through your process if you could. Yeah, sure. Well, there's, there's, there, most of the time that I'm on a documentary, I'm lucky enough to be the solo DP, this, this sort of the sole DP, which is fantastic. And then your, you know, your style guide is sort of useful if there are other people shooting, like if you're in another city obviously um but my style guide uh comes from literally um i'm trying to think of how i would do this or how i would say i would do it um well i mean how do you articulate it to the director or documentary directors going out and saying we're going to shoot the we're going to shoot the interviews you know in tarotron style or we're going to only shoot active interviews with people walking around like is that part of the the pre-thinking well some of the directors some directors i've worked with particularly say like morgan neville i worked with him a little bit on 20 feet from stardom i came in later in the production um so i shot maybe two or three of the interviews and those the style had already been set so Mm -hmm. uh i worked a little bit on the mr rogers documentary uh, won't you be my neighbor i shot three that looks amazing three interviews there and that graham willoughby was the main dp on that so he had already set the style so and that those were uh, shot with an interdron and totally the octobank and all that. It looked, they looked fantastic, and I emulated um, Graham style. For me, I, I approach it. I think every director is different. So Morgan's very specific about like I want this, this, and this for a certain reason. But most directors, I would say, uh, come to me for for advice about how to shoot it. Mm. And often I'm um, either pulling interview stills from my my own previous interviews, or just random internet stuff where you look at you know, uh, or or interviews that you want to emulate. A, you know, a film that they really enjoy. Like I really like the look of these. Interviews. Why do why do I want to look? You know, why do I like this look? Do, is it because they're against a black or gray background? Is it is it a neutral thing? I, you know, there's like, do we want to do long lens so the background falls away, or are we doing really kind of an in situ where we want to see the environment that the character's sitting in? There's a, another example of one that we did. Uh, a woman named Jessica Yu. I've worked with her a number of times. We did a film, first film called uh, Breathing Lessons, that actually won the uh, documentary short back in 1996. The recent project I had done with her was a film about James Terrell, the light artist. So J- James Terrell has a place called Roden Crater in northern Arizona where we were lucky enough to shoot for three or four days. We did a crazy amount of time lapses. It's an art installation kind of in an, an extinct volcanic crater. And it's it's basically he's saying he's, to quote James, he's making a pre-made ruin. Um, there are passage 
passageways where light at a at the solstice will you know a thousand feet you know go from uh, the sun will come and he's worked with astronomers mm-hmm. and you know to get the uh, to get the alignment right so a back passage that's a thousand feet down this tube Whoa. you know will like illuminate it's pretty amazing anyway to try to visualize that art too is incredibly challenging but for an example back getting back to interviews Jessica you was very um, keen on not wanting to kind of have the background or any kind of lighting setup compete with James James is like a Ansel Adams type figure to me he's so incredibly articulate so well known so powerful his art is amazing and I'm so um, inspired by his work I was sort of intimidated by lighting him too because his his medium <laughs> his, his medium is light right so and just to hear him talk was amazing but also to you know sort of feel like I'm lighting sort of a genius that knows how light can affect you know images <laughs> just bring in one like, clamp yeah. light and <laughs> stick it in the frame a so little we bit. talked a lot about how to do how to do this setup and I think we came into the a conclusion that we wanted him in black we wanted just a total black void mm-hmm. um, and Jessica always intended to have him black and white and not in any color just to make it sort of as pure as possible uh, black and white just it's James talking about his work um, so there's no it's all black so we had to create it of course they ha- we were shooting in a at the crater in you know James is all about light so the public spaces that he's created are all filled with light so in order to create this black box you know the sort of the black void we had to create a black box and mm-hmm. bringing things in from um, I think from Flagstaff or Phoenix or wherever, uh, you know, driving up all these, you know, these big 12 by pieces and building the thing. We took us a half day to build it and three hours to shoot it and another, you know, bit to wrap. But the, the idea of creating this this void was was very effective. I mean, you see you see it on camera and and uh, you know his side angle is so lovely and he's talking about light and he sort of it's just it's it's it worked out really well. So I think the con- the concept of that certainly came from the director, but I was able to help her kind of facilitate the look and. You know, she wasn't really clear about how she wanted to kind of isolate him in a way that respected his respect for light. But uh, we, we sort of succeeded in that way with his interview. And it's lovely. It's lovely. And, you know, certain interviews like on we were I was talking earlier about Shakespeare Behind Bars. This is the film about the inmates at prison in Kentucky doing Shakespeare. Um, we were doing everything handheld. We were walking. It's about a mile from the front of the where we check in um back into the where the guys were rehearsing yeah so and we could we only had like three people with us so in order to carry camera batteries we didn't we opted not to take the the tripod mm-hmm. plus the prison people were not they, we, we couldn't store anything we couldn't like so it was just to be run and gun we were like let's shoot without tripod so a lot of times we ended up shooting and we had to we shoot all these interviews handheld so uh we would get, get you in shape totally get me build, in shape. Up, build up those shoulders and um you know we, we i developed a thing i love the cine saddle so i use the cine saddle on occasion to kind of wedge my you know or we'd borrow a blanket off somebody's bed and kind of put a little the bit cine saddle. No, we, we've like, never discussed the cine saddle on it oh <laughs> and i know we're not technology <laughs> but I, I have a cine saddle too and i love it i can't travel without it so d- tell people about the cine saddle it's so <laughs> I can't damn cool we're talking about the cine saddle. it's awesome <laughs> I had to refill it three times. That's Have how you? much I've used it. Yeah, so I've owned it maybe fifteen years. I would say, you know, or maybe one or like early, early, you know, early. Uh, I when did the Cine Saddle come out? Um, am, I, am I predating this? I'm not saddle? sure. Like, I used to write for Backstage, and I remember I had I was always writing technical film stuff, and I and I interviewed the guy who created the Cine Saddle. It's He's Australian. I yeah, think, right? I think it's an Australian yeah. company. Yeah. I just enjoy it because it's so versatile and it's also such a simple tool. Um, I carry very little in my documentary work. I'm really, I do 99% handheld. That's not true, but a lot of handheld. Um, Mm. And when I need a quick uh, low angle, I do a lot of low angle. I like seeing things from different different perspectives. You know, anybody can stick a camera on a tripod and do like an establishing shot. But if you try to either do it up or up high off a roof or really low, it sort of it sort of adds a different perspective on it. So and I sort of got bored of like the tripod shots of like you know a building. But so let's like you know put it on low on the ground and see some stuff or see you know cars in the foreground or you know see if you can get something in the foreground that's a little well, interesting or whatever. But the city saddle allows you to do that where you really just like you can plop the cine saddle down, plop your camera down, make sure it's steady and you're kind of eye to the IP so you're like steady in the camera. But it's a unique way to, to get really great shots. And it's a quick, easy tool. It's also really great for naps at the airport. <laughs> you know, so you can, you know, you can uh, you can use it that way. Well, but, um, how I always describe it is it's like for anyone who's ever like taken three sandbags and turned them into a, a makeshift camera mount on the beach or something, the cine saddle is just the thing that's designed to sure. do that automatically. Yeah. yeah. And it can take kind of any size camera and yeah. you, know, you can put a DSLR on it you can put a 35 millimeter camera on it sure another another way I use it we're t- is talking about interviews a lot of people are wanting handheld interviews now I think in my documentary work sometimes if if the film is mostly verite it's really challenging to then cut to 
a tripod shot of an interview, right? Yeah. So I just did a film where um, they needed to do an interview. Literally, it, would took, it took place over two days. And it would have been, the, it's it's a large part of the film. The film is 99% verite, and they just didn't want to do the, the, the tripod, the, the interviews on the tripod. But knowing we were going to be doing a two-hour interview, I was like, I, 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 that's, I have my limits. You know, anybody has their limits. Well, holding a, anyone you know? holding a camera on their shoulder for two hours, that yeah. sounds like torture. Yeah. And so I said, well, let's try. You know, I did it for the first hour. And then I was like, all right, I have to come up with a solution. <laughs> I was like, well, duh, I have my cine saddle and the tripod right here. But just put the cine saddle on top. I mean, this is not like, you know, breaking news, but it's like, I'm sure people have done this all the time. We tried a couple things on Parks and Rec to, to try to get the same effect. But I just put the tri- I literally spread the tripod and then I put the cine saddle on top of that and then I put the camera on that so I'm actually you know the weight of the camera is supported by the tripod but it's still loose and and you know I don't like the loose head thing I don't like often people want loose head interviews which mm-hmm. is sort of like roaming kind of it's like, like the NYPD blue like look. yes I to me that's stupid I want <laughs> now like the, the key about this also I mean to be completely honest and 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 to get a little serious here is honestly like I feel like in documentaries I'm always it's the camera's an extension of of somebody that's in the room so the camera to me should reflect the experience that the viewer's having but also like there's somebody in the room like a human behind the camera so I feel like in this environment I think that that in this one interview in this one set of interviews that we we're doing for this uh, documentary that was 99% handheld and they didn't want to do any tripod um, interviews was just tripod and he's not all the camera and I'm literally kind of just I'm by the by the side of the camera just holding it so you mm-hmm. can see a little movement you know when I adjust things or when she or he or she moves forward or back I'm constantly like adjusting focus so there's a little bit of human nature behind the camera so there's a little bit of movement which I think humanizes the camera work and and kind of then allows handheld ish interview to be cut with some with converte because I think some people are, are freaked out and scared about you know how when a, when you cut to an interview in a documentary that's like locked solid it sort of means something it's like okay we're here to, to you know talk to this person it's it's a very serious moment but instead yeah. it's sort of like it can be a little bit more spontaneous I feel like with a sort of handheld or handheld looking interview it can mean you know that we've just sat down with somebody and it's a little I don't know there's something human about uh, about it that sort of adds a little something that said there are total moments like with James Terrell that we wanted to be we wanted to be on tripod we wanted to have that more control I mean we did the side angle you know we're pretty tight on them on on his side angle you know eyebrow to maybe just below chin so there's no way you could do that handheld for you know more than a couple of minutes but you know again with the documentary is that there's no rules I think any with any filmmaking there's no rules I think whatever helps propel the story forward that's a, the, the key I think too is um, whatever sort of makes sense again this sort of visual theme discussion comes into play as well as uh as well as what sort of feels right and helps again pro- propel the story forward. I think it's interesting to talk about like the different style the way I think people don't think about it that y- you could do an interview the way they do it on like 60 minutes or you could do an interview that's literally just walking down the street, you know, like um Nick Broomfield style sure, where you sure. just kind of wander up to someone and just start talking. Absolutely. And uh, everything in between. Exactly. Yeah. And and I guess that's kind of what I'm trying to drill down to and you've already answered a lot of it is is just sort of like what are some of the processes, the thought processes that go into sure. figuring out like if if you're the sole DP and you're being hired to shoot the whole the whole documentary and, and also uh, something that, that keeps occurring to me as well while you're talking is I think probably a lot of people don't know you know when you think about making a narrative feature you're making Ant-Man or you're making uh, you know Black Panther I think a lot of people have a clear idea of how the director and the DP's job is divided or even on an independent film sure. but on a documentary it goes a little bit different right like like the director isn't dictating shots to you sometimes you're just finding Rarely. a bunch of stuff yeah absolutely yeah. so could Talk about maybe just the process of working with a director on a documentary and what the two of you rely on each other for in in that relationship, which is is distinct and different from narrative. Sure. Interesting. Uh, we had two questions in there. One was like how yeah how you approach sort of interviews or how you approach or talking with the DP director relationship. I think, you know, again, going back to whatever... I mean, it, you're right that there there could be, uh, you know, man on the street interviews that we've done, you know, like the Shakespeare ones that are just handheld and we're literally, we're there, it's a little setup, there's no lights, but we kind of find a pleasing composition. But we knew that we wanted those to feel like we were just literally day in the life of the guys on the ward. Um, we wanted those interviews to feel like they f- we were just, you know, hanging out with the guys in the cell blocks, you know, in, mm. in their in their cells, literally. And pretty, pretty amazing. Um, I think those being handheld, it felt there's an immediacy there. Uh, the, again, this you know, human nature behind a camera sort of if we would 
have put them on a tripod, it would have felt a little more newsy. It would have been you know, a little bit more formal, and we didn't want that. It didn't well, feel organic. And so, if I can ask something, too. If yeah. you put it on a tripod, would it now also feel more formal to them in their interview would be a different absolutely. interview? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it's sort of like, you know, any time I think you set up this sort of, the setup, you know, bring in light stands. I mean, talk about, you know, uh, how sensitive one needs to be, at least from my documentary cinematography standpoint, whenever I come into a home, I'm like, let's leave the tripod or let's leave the C stands, you know, in the in the garage. Let's leave everything we can anywhere other than inside the house because mm-hmm. the minute you start bringing GAC in, you're already interrupting their lives. They're, you're asking for, for real people to share their lives with you. You know, you've asked them for a certain amount of time and then here we are like sort of in, imposing, you know, certain, you know, sit here and say this and be spontaneous now. So to try to, you're right, be very conscious of that. These are real people and so it's an, it's a great point. I actually haven't thought of, I hadn't thought about that. I've been doing some mentoring and some teaching and I, I often have my students like sit in the interviewer's chair, the the person being interviewed to mm-hmm. see how much all the gack and the lights affect an environment. You know, I mean, at the vibe of a room, I mean, even here, it's like, you know, you and I could have a conversation, but now there's microphones involved. So you're like, exactly. oh, I need to act a certain way or I need to be <laughs> a certain person or I need to, you know, say, you know, funny war stories or whatever, you know, but um, it better be it, funny. It better be funny. Better be very, you know, <laughs> but in any case, you know, and how, how would, how would a director and I work together again? There are, runs the gamut, you know, there are, without naming names, there are certainly people that rely on me heavily for directing, almost directing the scene. Oh, really? If somebody, you know, puts me in a room with certain people and they step out um, and I don't really know what's happening, I'm making the choices about who I'm focusing on, really what the... St- story, how I follow the story. Um, let's give an example. I want to say like two people who are married, recently married, who are having some marital problems. Um, this is a real world uh, this thing called Ma- Married in America. Mm-hmm. I'll name names. Michael Apted uh, is a filmmaker I've worked with and he's fantastic. <laughs> and uh, Michael is amazing and so experienced and he has uh, so Married in America is a film. Well, he did. You know, Michael Apted did like all the 7 Up movies. The like. Up series, right. So yeah. this, this film actually is called Married in America. Very similar. What was it? I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. We have yeah, to back yeah, up. You're okay. bearing the lead here a little bit. <laughs> so you worked for one of the most significant documentarians like in film history. As a documentarian yourself, and you're going to go work with somebody who kind of set the standard for, sure. for documentary for a lot of people. What was it like going going to work for somebody and knowing like this is the eye that made 7-Up se- seven seven and is still, is still making those Absolutely. damn movies. Yeah, and so prolific and doing yeah. everything from documentaries to uh, I think he's done some commercial branded yeah. content as well as features. I mean the Bond uh, Bond films. And, yeah, uh, he's a big, it's uh, a big deal. So. Now, now uh, Coal Miner's daughter like, you know, just pretty amazing. He's been around. Work. I believe he was also the president of the DGA for some time. Yes, I believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's incredibly prolific and in, so Incredible, incredibly he's, nice guy. He's going places. So Married in America is a film about nine married couples, um, now half of which are divorced, mm-hmm. um, which is statistically accurate. So we, uh, he's opted to follow the new relationships, whoever wants to still be involved with the film. So we're on the third film now. Um, we shot the first film a few years ago, the second film uh, a few years ago. Uh, I shot the some B-roll on the first one. That's how I met Michael. Peter Gilbert shot the first one. He shot mm-hmm. Hoop Dreams, and um, I met Michael just doing some B-roll on the first on the first project. So I think that was my like introduction to him. They knew Peter was moving on into directing, so I think uh, they knew they needed a DP. So it was like a nice way to kind of break the ice, and we hit it off immediately. It was great. I think our approach is similar. Um, our sort of very hands-off approach, but also just sort of uh, our patience and our experience was was similar. And when we went to shoot the second one, um, it was a joy. Where Working with him because I feel like he's able to tell me kind of the macro of of a scene as well as the micro of a scene. And what I mean by that was like he can tell me kind of where he thinks this scene that we're shooting or potentially shooting, even though he doesn't know anything about what's going to happen. He's walking into a house where there's a there's husband a and wife and they're husband about and wife to... having mar- marital problems, right, yeah. or something. You know, say that as a so he knew hypothetical. So- he's. So is he intuiting that or is this based on interviews? Based on pure experience. He knows like, okay, this is going to fit in the film, maybe in the second act, you know, they're going to, or, you know, first act, whatever. He knows knows kind of in a general sense where he thinks this, this scene might go. So in the larger sense, we kind of know, or we've already established this character, these two characters, and we already had, so we'd already shot them. But, um, you know, this is, this is to, you know, show how some new, the new, newly married couples are, you know, have sometimes have marital problems. So he knows the sort of the macro and can kind of tell me, okay, this is where I want the, the big picture to be. This is the bigger theme of this particular film, of this particular scene and where it will fit, fit in the film. So he can able to, he tells me the macro of a scene and then also the micro of a scene. And so he can tell me literally like, okay, I want to see, 
if you can if you can visualize um, the tension between the two of them, that's what I want you to focus on. So mm-hmm. that one direction is fantastic because not only do I know where the scene might happen, but also I'm knowing what he wants to look for and what's he what he wants to achieve uh, visually in this scene. So a seemingly mundane scene of two people making dinner, you mm-hmm. know, it could be just a boring scene, but because he planted that seed in my brain, like okay, I think a little kernel of information about these people are having marital problems. How can we visualize that? You know, when the gentleman's cutting carrots very rapidly, I'm like, okay, slowly, you know, zooming in a little (laughs) bit to visualize that. You know, she's setting the table, sharply setting the dishes down on the table, kind of in a a haphazard way, but also kind of like intentional, the sort of body language and physical position in the, I remember shooting a wide shot, um, you know, where the two of them are kind of having a conversation, but they're in the opposite sides of the kitchen. You know, they're not really physically close to each other. So that was another way I could visualize the sort of tension in the air. And and one thing that I like to do too is, and I think Michael's in tune with this as well, I like to use my emotional response to a scene to inform my work. And what I mean by that is I I feel like, you know, anything that sort of, if if you feel tension in a room, you want to like, how can I visualize that? I'm constantly kind of racking my brain like, okay, I've got the wide. Um, you know, I started out, out of, I went to film school and I worked as an assistant editor for many years. So I worked mm-hmm. in post a lot. But my post-production work has had really informed my ability now as a cinematographer to shoot a scene in a way that not only tells the story, um, but also allows an editor to cut the scene in a way that I kind of want them to cut it. So I give him or her like, you know, cutaways of this, again, these story elements that I want. So in this particular scene, this hypothetical, that's not really, it's actually not a hypothetical, it's a real scene that I shot, you know, showing these two, these two people like physically apart in a room, showing the, the, the guy who's chopping the carrots really loudly, as well as following the dialogue and kind of getting your, your, you know, your coverage as well as, as well as reaction shots. Sometimes I also say that, um, and I found this in my work, sometimes the story is told in the reaction versus in the action. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times even even in this in this one example, you can really read when somebody is talking, like some you know he's talking just but it's her reaction that you really get more story about you know or you see more story in her reaction than you do in in showing him talking. Yeah. yeah. So often you know you you t- we talk a lot about in documentaries following the ball or you know where people you just follow the person talking, but then that's not very easy to edit. Um, plus, I find that honestly in scenes, especially emotionally charged scenes, that a lot of times there's more story in the reaction than in the action. I mean, Meaning that, you know, showing the person listening versus the person talking. So again, you have to kind of gauge that and, you know, you're telling a story constantly and you're trying to making choices on the fly. And again, getting back to Michael, you know, when the scene sort of seemingly ends, you know, five or 10 minutes later, or maybe even a half an hour later, he'll come to me and say, I think, I think we've got it. And I said, no, I need to get a couple more shots. And he's like, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But when you've done that, you know, let's go in because there's another scene happening. And, you know, he has an ability to kind of let it play, which Mm -hmm. is one thing I really, really enjoy about working with him. He has the patience to kind of let a scene play out. He's very hands off, very, on occasion, he's in the room kind of observing. He's always listening, as am I. I'm always listening to to dialogue, listening to sort of the, and feeling the vibe of a room. Um, but he's very patient and just lets things happen. And that's, I, 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 I approach my work in that way too. I don't like to, you know, force things. I don't want to have people redo things. And it's just, it, I want to be as, as fly on the wall as possible. That's my, I, I'm a purist in the sense, in terms of cinema verite. I, um, you know, each, each person has their own definition for it. But how I like to work is just really be as, as observational as possible um, and not impact the scene in a way that would, you know, sort of betray the story. I mean, Apted is, is again, sort of a consummate storyteller as well. So I, uh, again, his patience, his experience, his ability to let the let the scene play out is, is fantastic. And, you know, then there are other directors, certainly we're talking about the DP director relationship. Um, some DPs or some directors that are, you know, right by my side. Um, you know, often I, I am frustrated by somebody who wants to tell me kind of what to shoot shot by shot, but often that happens when we have very little time, um, yeah. which is very useful. So, um, you know, it, it runs the gamut. I mean, I, I appreciate those who are highly collaborative. Um, I really enjoy, uh, you know, sharing story elements and story ideas, and I'm constantly encouraging directors to watch dailies with me. Um, and we did that very often on Shakespeare Behind Bars. If, if we have the time to watch dailies, at least, you know, I, Sometimes I'll show them like a little snippet. Sometimes even if nobody has, if they don't have time to watch dailies, I, I do little frame grabs on my phone, literally taking pictures of, of the dailies off the screen, you know, off the, whatever viewer we're using, just to give them a sense of what we what we shot. So when you're watching dailies with the director, like what kinds of things are you looking for? I'm looking for re- 
reactions <laughs> from them. Uh, also, like I, <laughs> that's good. That's yeah, bad. Just like exactly what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, key key elements too is like just to see if we're on the same page. Like oh, I sh- you know, oftentimes nowadays, um, you know, now there's Teradex and and uh, so, yeah. you know, there's wireless monitors, etc. So people are watching what I'm shooting, uh, which doesn't make me nervous at all. But um, it just allows them to kind of pay attention. But often, even if people are sort of watching, quote unquote, um, they're not really sort of seeing or feeling a scene in a way that once you see dailies and once you kind of hear um, some people aren't kind of clued into the level that Sound Mixer and I are. So um, as an example, like just with dailies, there there are certain things that, you know, a director will see um, that they really like and that will try to emulate the next day or really try to get better or and something that doesn't work. You know, hey, I don't really like this. It was something I tried, you know, say I tried a certain angle on somebody and wow, that doesn't, didn't work. And I didn't know it didn't work until I saw it in dailies. But I'm, I'm constantly reviewing my footage. But I feel like it's a it's a way for the director and I to, or directors and I to really focus on story and like, okay, this really worked and I want to know more about this. You know, if somebody talked about growing up, you know, every day he walked by school and uh, now he's a I'm t- total hypothetical, but um, you know he's, he, he's now he's a postal carrier or something, and he walked yeah. and when he was a ch- child, and he you know he's uh, he talked about this sort of this post office in you know Columbus, Ohio or something, and then obviously we have to go and, and get this Columbus, Ohio post office shot or something like that. So there's a constant sort of check in. Well, um, uh, what about things like so, reenactments, like as a tool for documentary? Because oh, I feel like yeah. I feel like reenactments are such an interesting thing because they can go super cool or super hokey instantly. Right. right. In your work, um, do you mess with that stuff at all? I haven't done a lot. I've done a few. I'm a verite person and I literally am like flying the wall, like observational. And I rarely do recreations because I feel like there's a certain, I mean, there's certain things, certainly if you're trying to tell a story within Blue Line, for, in, for instance, exactly. you don't have the stock footage, you know, or whatever. And you want to kind of create, you know, take creative license. Absolutely. The film worked incredibly well. So, and maybe one of the first films that did it. I'm totally not bashing recreations at all because I don't, but I, just because I don't do them, I can't mm-hmm. speak to them in terms of how one would conceive of re- using recreations in a, in a, what do you call it, recrease? Recrease. Recrease. That's, recrease. What, that's what they call them when you're working on them. <laughs> Here, we're going to go shoot these recrease. Recrease. Um, but I think uh, whatever serves the story, certainly it's about storytelling, right? Yeah. I mean, in a documentary or a feature or whatever, you're telling a story. So whatever vehicle that you want to use, whatever tool you want to use, absolutely, you know, go for it and then just. But if you're going to do it, just go for it. And, I, and I remember really, the know. first time I ever took like a deep dive into documentary. I was in film school and we had a teacher, a guy named Jerry Hooper, who taught us, who taught our documentary class. And he was kind of spreading out this, you know, the constellation of different styles of documentary. And that's when he introduced me to probably my favorite documentary ever, Titicut Follies by Frederick Wiseman. But to me, it's, it's interesting to, to see because there is sort of like there's kind of a purest level of documentary filmmaking where it is like truly fly on the wall or very much acknowledging its own existence like Nick Broomfield or Michael Moore or whatever. Like there's a lot of people who it's like they're the filmmaker is part of it. You know, they're, they're affecting it. And then Werner Herzog or, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Although Werner Herzog like is always radically changing details and, and art directing stuff and admits to it. He's, sure. He, sure. He'll add stuff. Again, to tell the story. Yeah. He's telling a storyteller. I kind of enjoy the brazenness of somebody like Herzog and the complete, like, a structural version of somebody like uh, like Frederick Wiseman, but also on the flip side, you also have reality television where you're creating an expected narrative and you're using the tools of documentary, but you're kind of using them in a different way. Is mm-hmm. there anything you can? Uh, I don't want I don't want to get you in trouble. Well, but like how how because you've shot some some reality. One of the things I loved about you know I shot three seasons on uh, The Apprentice and four on Surv- four on Survivor. And you know what? Reality television. On I was on a panel uh, maybe four or five years ago, and I had you know we were talking with the panelists before we went out. I said I really don't want to talk about my reality, my reality television days. I just that's a, a chapter I just don't want to I don't want to talk about. <clears throat> and I've talked with other people who've shot reality, and I you know they say the same thing. Let's let's just forget about it. But then the woman sitting next to me, um, actually uh, Uta Breisowitz, who shot The Wire, the first season of The Wire. She's a mm-hmm. talented DP. Um, I'd mentioned, she's like, what, what shows have you shot? I said, well, so Apprentice and Survivor and Survivor. Wow. When I first had my kid, we were like, I'd come home from work and, and, uh, we would come and watch Survivor and it was our escape and it's so well shot. And the story is so compelling. It was our escape. And thank you for shooting it in such a way that like, and I was like, wow, okay, well, somebody enjoyed it. And she said, no, 60, however many millions of people watch it every night or watch it every week. And also we talked about it a little bit on that panel. And I came to realize that that the reality work that I've done really helped me 
learn to think on my feet, um, learn to think um, like an editor, certainly. I mean, I started again out, again, I started out as an um, assistant editor and in post-production. So I all of that work um, early on in my career out of after, after film school really informed my work later in a way that I can shoot a scene to help an editor, you know, craft a scene together that's very compact, very efficient, clear storytelling, clear character development, all of that. But on Survivor, often you're on your own, you know, so you're single camera verite coverage, essentially, totally wandering observational. Around the, so wandering around the woods, wandering following on, somebody. Yeah, wandering around the beach, you know, there's two, on Survivor, there's two sets of crews. There's a challenge and reality crew, sorry, challenge and tribal council crew. And then there's a real, what they call reality crew, where there's um, the people on the beach, you know, where as they're trying to figure out who's they're, who they're going to vote out or they're searching for food or searching for water or whatever, or just hiking and whatever. So it's, again, purely observational verite. So... I like the the uh, the challenge also of being able to really focus on story when you're covered in sand and hot and thirsty <laughs> and hungry and crazy stinky and crazy bitten up by mosquitoes and you just you have to brush all of that aside and focus on story. It's really a great exercise in in really concentrating. It's sort of a meditative quality mm. that really once you're I mean I've had a lot of jobs where there's a lot going on. There's a lot of people talking to you and a lot of like outside influences, especially on Survivor any of these reality shows. There's there's constantly somebody in your ear whatever but you just have to focus on story and that's what I appreciated about that reality experience especially on Apprentice too you're really just focusing on on who the characters are what their story is and get it and your responsibility is to to tell that story and and do it well and again I I really uh, credit the reality shows in teaching me how to how to work quickly and and on my own and and think on my feet well Um, and please correct what I'm about to say if I'm if I'm completely wrong but it seems like a lot of the documentary stuff you do is kind of very process driven where you're you're doing Shakespeare behind bars and you're interviewing inmates and you don't exactly know where the story is going to go. Like a, as a documentarian, you know, you're working with a director or whatever, but you're helping to kind of write the story. You're helping to kind of craft the story through through your medium. Whereas in reality television, there's a result they're going for. It's not, it's it's product driven, not process driven. Am I right about that? Well, certain reality shows. I mean, I think one of the things I liked about the, Bur- the um, Burnett shows is that you know, they're particularly on Apprentice um, and Survivor, for example, is it's a federally sanctioned game show, right? So they're yeah. playing for a million dollars. And there's a lawyer from CBS that is with us every every day, you know, just to monitor, make sure everything is on the up and up. So you're not allowed to have them redo things. You're not allowed to tell them where water is. You're not allowed to tell them where, you know, any idols are or whatever. So, because that would be cheating and that would be certainly impacting the, the show and they yeah. spend millions of dollars every episode, yada, yada. It's, it's true. Something like Survivor is just a game show that rewards uh, behavior instead of knowledge necessarily or or behavior and how you play or or some yeah strategy strategy yeah yeah. it's like using your your whole personality instead of just being on jeopardy and knowing you know what the knowledge based yeah yeah. um and and so to a degree was the apprentice although like the apprentice uh did you work on the celebrity apprentice i did not the season two three and four it was before celebrity before martha okay so so celebrity so celebrity apprentice obviously is like people who are used to being on camera used to used to being in front of the regular apprentice that was those were just regular we did house reality and we had like observation stuff of them between mm-hmm. tasks and all that so it was really character driven I mean that's the one thing again about Burnett shows that I really liked was that you know there was a rule that never do anything again you know I don't know how it is now but back in the day it was very much yeah. a purist you know very much a kind of let's you know you can't redo something if you miss it you got to find another way to t- you know, tell a story if you f- if you miss a big beat you got to kind of come up with a creative way to to tell that story without you know without having having anybody redo something so but is, I think, it, is this I think, stage scenario but you're making a real documentary about it abs- in my opinion yes that's how I approached it, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there are you know people will, that will say what they want about reality television and that's all crafted, but the episodes that are the seasons that I shot, both on Survivor and Apprentice, very observational, very... Like, yeah, on Apprentice, we weren't even allowed to wear watches that or, or even t- tell them which direction North was. I mean, like, there's very hands-off and they weren't even allowed to talk to us. At the very end of the show, I remember sometimes they would, you know, they would start to learn our names, even though we're not allowed to talk with them at all. Mm-hmm. That would really freak us out at the very end, especially even on Survivor 2. They'd be like, hey, Shauna, how are you doing? It's like, how do you know my name you know but um but you know we walkie talkie everybody and back and forth so people you know observational we they were turning the tables on us and like watching us all the time so they knew our names and knew that we were, where we were from and this and that were like oh, very wow. very creeped out but um <laughs> but you know the tables it's turnabout's fair play certainly in that environment um but the reality that i enjoyed doing was much more observational much more sort of documentary in its execution, uh, mm-hmm. how it was done was very observational and, and that sort of fit um, what I like to do. It is sort of aligned with my 
core values of, the, you know, this traditional verite. When it started getting into the other ones, like that I'd mentioned before, that maybe I won't mention the names, that, um, you know, some of the reality shows that I worked on were very scripted and they had a very um, sort of distinctive and, and very deliberate storyline that they wanted to tell. And so they would, you know, put people in a room and say, talk about this, and then, you know, okay, roll the cameras. And that kind of stuff was not, I didn't do much of that. I kind of said, okay, enough is enough. And then right about that time, actually, I got a call about Parks and Recreation, the, you know, scripted show for NBC. Yeah. And I got called by the first, the DP who shot the first season. I was a camera operator on that. On Parks and Recreation, I was a camera operator. I was called for on, the first on the first season. Season. Uh, season one through four. Okay. So I did four seasons of Parks and Recreation, did the pilot in the first six episodes. The guy who was a DP was a guy named Peter Smokler, who actually shot Spinal Tap. Um, oh, wow. Which was a, one of my favorite all-time, you know, documentaries. One of the influential, actually, for pieces. Real? For Yeah, totally. Peter is amazing. And he had mentioned that uh, on, on you know, after doing a few seasons, or sorry, a few episodes of Parks and Rec with him, I was, certainly was fangirling out saying, you have to tell me all about Spinal Tap and how you did Seriously. it. Seriously. And he was saying on Spinal Tap, it's about it was about half scripted, half um, improv. And uh, they needed a documentary cinematographer to really kind of go with the actors when they were improving, sort of in character improv. He does all with Sunny in Philadelphia. He's done a number of things. I mean, he's he's a talented. Peter's amazing. And when Peter was calling around for Parks and Rec, he wanted somebody who had some scripted experience. So I had done a few features, a bunch of student films, and and also some scripted shorts, and um, done a few pilots and three features, I think. So I'd done a fair amount of scripted, uh, and then I'd done a, a heck of a lot of uh, documentaries. And there's very few people that do both that kind of have their 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 toe dipped in both ponds. Um, and yeah, then, it's very unusual. And then, so he he said, "Well, it's sort of going to be this sort of part scripted, part part improv thing. Are you interested?" I said, "Absolutely." I needed to change. I needed to yeah. get out of that sort of reality stuff that was, you know, I think uh, in the early two thousands, the documentary funding had kind of dried up, and you know, I had done done some reality, had done a fairly some large budget documentaries, but the kind of bread and butter stuff, um, I needed I needed a little bit of a change too. I'd been traveling a lot, so I wanted to stay home and maybe do a union show. So it was something totally different. I think one of the things that I find myself doing too is, is like an ex- as an example, I did three seasons on The Apprentice. And after the third season, I was like, you know, I've, I'm done. You know, I've done mm-hmm. my thing. I've done this. And I've, it's always kind of, even though it's not ever the same thing twice, it's the, the idea of the show and kind of the structure of the show I was kind of done with. I was like, done, I've done it. I'd, I'd said, okay, that's a tick box. I've checked that box. Right? Yeah. Then I wanted to challenge myself with Survivor. Um, I knew that there had never been a woman shooting on Survivor. So I said, I want to be the first. And I went and met, I remember meeting, uh, going to the office, the, the two of the producers on the show. They're like, why the, why do you, why the hell do you want to do this? Are you, and are you really sure you want to do this? I said, I'm absolutely sure. I feel like I want to challenge myself in a way that, you know, I love the outdoors. I love to travel and I love, um, you know, I, I love the show. It's fantastic. I also wanted to work on something that the people would see every week. You know, it's nice to be able to work on something that, you know, you tell somebody you work on so and it's oh, a yeah. show and you're like, oh yeah, we, I totally know what that is, you know. Before that, it was mostly obscure stuff, documentary stuff, whatever. People go to film festivals know about it. But anyway, it was nice to work on something that people really re- would recognize and my work would be seen every every week. And it was fun to shoot. I had a lot of friends on the show and they were like, oh, you should do it. So, and I did it. And so four seasons of that. And then I was like, you know, I've done this. I've done it. I proved it to myself. I can do it. Um, they loved me enough to bring me back for season after season after season. And I'd done that. And then that was when I went on to Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec was amazing. It was fantastic. You know, working with Peter and we had a couple other DPs throughout the years. And being a camera operator on that show, you're kind of like almost the DP. I mean, you're, we were really, I mean, it was a lot of, a lot of it was scripted. After every scripted bit, there was always what they called a fun run. Um, you know, the sort of like the actors were, were allowed to kind of go off script a little bit or try a new punchline out or something. And often, what, what, often what percentage of that made it in, into the final show? Uh, I would say at least there's one bit of a fun run in every episode. Oh, nice. There's like a little tagline or a little, you know, um, most of the time it would be at the end of the show, the little tag at the end of, you know, the end of the show, you know, some, again, different, different punchline or if somebody wanted to do punchline of their own that wasn't written or, you know, and oftentimes they would change their blocking as well. And so we'd have to be ready for that. And it was always shot with two cameras, always two cameras, you know, on occasion we'd have a single camera thing, but most of the time it was two cameras, but that was fun. It was fantastic. It was a great blending of my scripted skills and my documentary skills. And I was able to laugh every day. I mean, like, pee in your pants laughing <laughs> laughter i mean it was like really belly laugh i bet like, with that you know, Kurt, like it's it, like a, a, a murderer's row of some of the it, most funny people working today amazing i mean amy amy's from the top down i mean amy was amazing nick nick offerman is one of my favorite people in the world i saw him at sundance he had a new film called hearts beat loud that he's fantastic in it sort of breaks the ron 
Swanson mm-hmm. mold, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's got to be. Know. It's always got to be hard for actors who create such an iconic role to like then ever back away from it. And I always appreciate the people who can do that. Absolutely, and I think Nick does that in this film. And and you know, he's got a, a, a incredible. He's just incredibly, just an incredible person, but also an incredible talent. But to be able to work with people like Amy and Nick and Rashida and Aziz and Chris Pratt, who's now like just a fucking rock star, right? Seriously, you know, all of them. <laughs> um, Every one of them, like that was the launch pad for a, a way bigger career. Except you know, Amy. Polar was already kind of a sure. household name, but sure. the rest of those people I never yeah, heard of Aubrey before. Yeah, Aubrey Plaza. I mean, yeah. Rob was fantastic. Adam Scott, like, yeah. you know, just it goes on and on. Retta's now in a new show. Um, Jim Whitehair has done a great deal of stuff, and it's so, uh, it's it's a, it was a great show. I mean, it's fantastic. But again, after four seasons, I was kind of like, you know, I've done this, and I also was a camera operator. I, I knew I could DP. I knew I wanted to kind of spread my wings, and I also mm-hmm. really missed the documentary work. I really. You know, I enjoyed working in the scripted environment, and I, you know, half-hour comedy is fantastic. It's a five-day schedule. It's, you know, we're out for three days and usually on studio for, you know, on stage for two days. And it was a great kind of change of pace for me. It was a union. It was just, it was a different vibe. But I missed my documentary work, and so I feel like after four seasons, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm done. I, I want to get back to what really makes me sort of feel most alive so in my it work. It sounds like so. your expiration date on anything is like three to four <laughs> years, and then you're ready to do a different thing. I have to say, it's kind of, it, it kind of, yeah. I'm constantly wanting to challenge myself and mm. and and learn new things and learn learn new skills and go new places and meet new people and tell new stories. I mean, there's so many stories out there in the world. I feel like uh, you know part of my responsibility as a documentary cinematographer and it's kind of really how I how I identify myself now as I used to be a cinematographer, but now I'm kind of a documentary cinematographer. I have the responsibility to to help visualize, help tell these stories of sometimes famous people, but most of the time just seemingly kind of ordinary people. Um, you know, we all have a valuable story to tell. I think if we continue to share our stories with each other, I think we become better humans. And, and I, I think for me, it's all about communicating and connection. We're not only we're connecting with crew members, but connecting with subject, connecting with the story. I don't know. There's there's something about connecting with, with, with my documentary work that is so fulfilling. The cinematography world is overwhelmingly men. Yeah. And and can be outrageously sexist. I feel like it's becoming less so Absolutely. over the last few years. One of the first times we were at a, a Q and A, it premiered at Sundance in two thousand five, Shakespeare Pine Bars, and one of the first questions was what what it was what was it like shooting in a men's prison, and somebody outright asked, would it have been a different film if you were a male, a, a guy? And I thought about it, and I actually hadn't ever thought about it because you're right. There's there's really not much about my career my gender has anything to do with I just happen to be a sensitive sort of being that Mm -hmm. comes to her work with you know experience and sensitivity and I'm a good human I'm a good person I make people feel at ease quite quickly it just all these people skills kind of come come before my technical skills um a lot of times and so I I feel very sort of well uh suited for documentary work because I'm just who I am it's not necessarily because of my gender but this question about um, if I were a guy shooting the Shakespeare Behind Bars project, if you see it, you realize that the guys opened up to me in a way that I don't think they would have opened up to if I were a guy. I think I was receptive. I was sensitive. I was emotionally responding. You know, they would tell us their stories about what they did. And, and um, the filmmakers were very intent on not asking what the guys did, like, not outright. That was just kind of not something we did. It was just yeah. we were hanging out with them. They were actors to us. Um, they were cool guys. We wanted to treat them as actors. Um, you know, so yes, they were prisoners, but we wanted to treat them as equals and as actors and t- take them and their serious, their work very seriously. And I think they really responded to that. Um, and then when they chose, you know, three or four months in, one guy waited seven or eight months to tell us what he did. But when they did, they told us about their crimes in their own way, in their own time, and in their own words. Uh, and it was really revealing, incredibly touching, and a wonderful moment. You know, we'd shoot these interviews with these guys, and they'd tell us what they did. And uh, we'd just afterwards, you know, put the camera down. And by then, we'd knew, known the guards, and we had a, an inmate, sorry, a, a non-inmate um, the director that was often with us, but also the, uh, the the guard that was assigned to us that would, you know, observe us. So we were allowed to sh- hug the guys. And once we put, we, this one in, in particular, a guy named Hal told us his crime, and we shot it. And, you know, I had to change a battery and change it. We back then, we were shooting tape. I put the camera down, and I just hugged him. I was like, wow. That's pretty serious. I mean, he's a murderer. But I, by then, we had spent seven or eight months with him, and uh, I'd gotten to know him as a person and as an actor, as somebody struggling mm-hmm. with redemption and forgiveness, self-redemption, self-forgiveness, really trying to find a way to forgive himself, trying to find a way to have the families that of the people his victim. 
um, forgive him. And it just, you know, uh, uh, st- then it became a story f- uh, of, of his struggle. And I think because I was, again, so sensitive and, and again, maybe it's because I'm a woman and because it's, it's who I am, but it sort of uh, um, got us some really amazing stories, a really amazing moment. So um, my gender hasn't really played a lot uh, into my career, um, but in that one instance, I think it did actually act as a great advantage um, in that story. So... Talk a little bit about uh, sort of your your background. You, you went to film school, correct? I went to Loyola Marymount Film School um, after you know, g- uh, getting a, a still camera from an uncle uh, who was a world traveler. He just had like a spare camera, and he, mm. he knew I was really interested. One of my ear- earliest uh, childhood memories actually is looking through the Fisher Price camera. Um, it's actually an image on my business card. <laughs> oh wow! It. Do you remember the Fisher Price cameras where you you turn the? Um, there's literally a Fisher Price camera that looks almost like a view camera. You look through the it's camera. Not that. Pixel up to light. No, it's not Pixel Vision. Um, it's Fisher Price little toy camera that you would rotate there's like four or five six Mm. images of like a a boy and a farm and a kid with a a puppy and all this stuff and I was enamored with that toy and it was a camera it was literally a camera and a little flash flash cube on the top that turned and so I did not take actual (laughs) pictures but I enjoyed looking looking through it I also enjoyed my mother had a brownie camera that I remember taking you know really young I have a picture of me like very young in diapers no top just diapers and I'm like looking through the wrong end of her camera but she said I used to love to look through it look through cameras it was just my thing I used to love to like try to see what I don't know it was just something as a kid I would do so when my uncle gave me a camera I was like wow I totally did not know what I was doing and it was the first time I was shooting 35 millimeter and I was like all right let's so my parents bought me a few rolls of film and just said go and try and I was like wow this is cool and I learned I sort of taught myself you know shutter speed and iris and film speed all that stuff just the basics like you know, when you were reading a, a book when I was a kid maybe in third or fourth grade whatever oh wow and then did uh, did some stop motion animation when I was in seventh and eighth grade. You Neat. know, I don't know what kid didn't, and you know, or didn't. Uh, maybe lots of kids didn't, but I did. It was re- super fun to um, did a film called The Hero That Almost Wasn't about it. You know, like crazy, you know, hero. With the Do you still train. have any like, of those I films? I still have. Yes, I still have the super eights. Oh, Not man. transferred, but you I, transfer it while while I should. <laughs> while tell us. I did. I did a, a sequel in eighth grade. I did that one in seventh grade. I did a sequel in eighth grade that apparently somebody just I didn't know anything about film and how that worked. That was mm. the first time I'd shot super eight, and I was doing literally on stop motion so I was doing a couple frames you know every every little movement and doing like full on you know um art what is it, Ardman Studios or whatever, like full-on Wallace yeah, and yeah. Gromit style, you know, clay animation, essentially. And oh, nice. If the lights were too hot, the guys would melt and, you know, all that. <laughs> it was like a total, it was a fantastic learning, though. Yeah. And then I saw the film and it, like, totally worked. It was fantastic. Three minutes of, like, this little story. And I was like, wow. And I'd mapped it all out and mapped it out to, you know, see how many how many frames each second and how many, you know, if I want this arm to go down three seconds. And I did the math. It's a lot it's of patience fantastic. for an eighth grade. Totally. Seven, that was a seventh grade. Oh. And in eighth grade, I did a sequel. And apparently, I you know, I didn't know that much about film. And somebody, the teacher said, oh, I have this roll of Super 8 that's been in my drawer for a few years. Go ahead and use it. And oh. I used it and I spent, you know, the whole semester doing this sequel. Yes, exactly. I know <laughs> You're where the story And it was completely, somehow it had overexposed and uh. somehow it had flashed. And so you could see a little piece of it. And I'm sure if I if I um, transferred it today, they probably would be able to save it. But the only thing I remember from that, from the eighth grade, you know, screening of the projects and I, well, mine was the only sort of film they were doing. I remember the lowering the lights and turning on the thing because it was literally the first time I had seen it at, when it came back from the lab. Oh, no. <laughs> and it just, it was like, just overexposed oh. and completely I just all I remember was crying I just cried oh but it was a great learning because it was like okay you got to know where your film stock's coming from right so and then yeah. and then I went to film school then went to high school actually I did some lighting in in, in high school kind of discovered how in theater stage lighting that actually lighting can create and evoke mood right different mood so I think the natural combination for me of the, my interest in photography and lighting I was like ah, oh, cinematography I also really enjoyed seeing I I, I watched a lot of documentaries um, my parents uh, there was a Sunday night like Disney show like a nature show the sort of like faux documentaries where they talk about you know a ranger going to save a wolf like that was wonderful injured. world of color or something whatever. like that yeah. right so there's sort of mini documentaries which I was enamored with and then I said well let's go to um, maybe film school so Loyola Marymount I went there and uh, you know ended up shooting a ton of other people's films that shot my own films so when you and got there were you this and this is something I, I'm always interested to hear what made you do this so like when you're in eighth grade seventh grade you're the director you're the DP you're the everything at what point did you start saying I'm gonna I'm gonna be over here with the camera and the right. lighting and I'm not I don't want to be the director I think because of I was always incredibly enamored with looking through a lens at the world mm-hmm. I knew I wanted to be a photographer I was already also in high school doing still photography as well, just sort of experimenting um, with a bigger and different camera. Um, also my 
parents had bought a video camera, so I was experimenting with that as well. Nice. So I just like just experimenting with the images and how um, I just loved, you know, seeing the world through a camera. I, I don't know why. I just sort so of, when you got to film school, you immediately I gravitated. I kind of knew, that. yeah, that I was I was really interested in cinematography. Um, and then I think once I f- shot my very first like Super Eight, you know, the first semester, second year at Loyola, you were shooting like Super Eight films, and I I shot my first Super Eight film, and I was absolutely hooked. I was like, wow, this is really cool. You know, um, and then seeing it, seeing the process of it, you know, it was back again, so you're shooting Super 8, totally, you know, an MOS project, or we, you know, just a little story, like uh, the assignment was to tell a story in a minute on mm-hmm. Super 8, so we, you'd shoot a minute, you'd only have, you'd have to shoot, edit in camera, or shoot in, you know, uh, edit in camera, whatever, so you, Same thing in my film school. Right, exactly, first, and then you'd give project. the camera to somebody else, so there'd be three films on one roll of film, so oh, it's like, it's crazy. So, um, you know, and they worked, some of them worked, some of them didn't work, but it was, I was hooked. It was fantastic. And then the great thing about Loyola is that they're, um, every student is responsible for their own project. So I was not only responsible for my own projects, but then that means a shit ton of projects are being shot. You know, I, I shot a lot of student films. I probably, you know, five or six each semester. So, oh, wow. you know, and that was fantastic for me in film school to be able to like, start developing a language between you know, directors and DPs. Um, I shot a ton of different films. Mean, this is back in the day when we're shooting film, um, working on different cameras or different film stocks. I was shooting reversal, shooting negative, shooting black and white reversal, like figuring what, what that what that looks like, playing with the images, playing with different genres, different styles. We did a couple documentaries in the mix, which was in the late 80s, like really kind of early to be shooting film documentaries in the student environment. But um, but it's fantastic, for sure. expensive <laughs> for sure, you know, um, but a great way to kind of get my feet wet and also make, I made a lot of mistakes in film school. And I think that's the place to do it is kind of learn by my, mis- you know, learn by your mistakes. I certainly made a yeah. few, we all did, you know, um, but I made a lot of great choices as well. I did a lot of great work and people, you know, I was sort of in demand in college and, and uh, expected after college to be like, all right, well, this is this is the world now. Maybe I'll be in demand. You know, I've, I've got a couple of films under my belt. I've got a little reel I've cut together. But I couldn't find a job to shoot to save my life. Like, I, I was really struggling to and try to And where were you located? At that? Were I was in already, Los Angeles. You were already in L.A. Yes, I was in L.A. Loyola Marymount's in, in L.A. Yeah. So I just kind of stayed here knowing that I grew up in Phoenix, knowing there was not a film community in Phoenix. And then I, I couldn't really find a job to shoot. I was doing some AC work, which was really not satisfying at all. And I knew I didn't want to kind of go that AC route. I mean, often um, shooters sort of work their way up either, you know, through electrical, through the lighting department or in camera, you know, AC and then you're loading and then AC yeah. and then operating, whatever. I knew I didn't want to wait because I knew I, wish, I knew I could shoot. I had a mentor also named Alan Davio, who's a DP. Oh, yeah. yeah you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That um, guy. E.T., Color Purple, yeah. um, you know, uh, Empire of the Sun, oh, which is Okay, so how did you end up with Alan Davio as <laughs> your mentor? A cinematography teacher at Loyola um, had gone to high school with Alan Davio. And once he'd seen my work in my first student my film, first, uh, not my, it wasn't my first student, once he'd seen a work in one of the student films that I had done, he said, I think I want to meet, I want to introduce you to Alan Davio. I said, Alan Davio? And by then he'd shot, you know, E.T. Yeah. and uh, Second Unit on Close Encounters and, you know, a number of, an Amblin, Stevens, you know, a student film and, you know, nice. already had a reputation, certainly. And I was like, absolutely. And Alan was more than gracious and so wonderful. He invited me on sets. And I, you know, my oh, first wow. set visits were like on these big giant, you know, Oreo cookie commercials, like um, or Reese's Pieces commercials that were like, you know, based on the ET thing. So we were doing like this big giant UFO on a set, you know, a soundstage at Raleigh. And I was like, just wide eyed and like, wow, this is amazing. But he said his advice to me, and I still have this, and I still tell my people I mentor is just, if you want to be a shooter, shoot anything you can get your hands on. If you want to direct, direct anything you can get your hands on. If you want to edit, edit anything you get your hands on so for me I knew as a shooter I wanted to shoot anything I get my hands on but also like I wasn't making any money doing it so I needed to find a way to kind of pay the bills but also still be able to shoot so I found a job actually as an assistant editor Um, and the job I got actually sorry going backwards a little bit I did an internship when I was in college for a company called ZM Productions, and they did the behind the scenes on the Steven Spielberg films. And coincidentally, Alan Davio's Empire of the Sun um, was being shot the summer I was interning for that company. I was doing some PA work. And they they ta- tasked me with sitting in Telecine uh, watching the behind the scenes of Empire of the Sun. No way. So I'm sitting there, you know, getting paid well, paid very little. Interns back then were, you know, I was making total minimum wage, but being being paid to watch, de- I was just doing logs and Holy kind of shit. like watching the making of, of Empire of the Sun. So not only I was that, watching- That is to this day one of my favorite Spielberg movies. It actually is really good. I think it's one and of the strongest. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he was, if Alan was nominated for that. I think he was, but in any case, 
you know, coincidentally watching a mentor at work and then also watching how a film is made and then seeing how the, this was for press materials. Back then, uh, they still had money where they would send a documentary crew shooting film behind the scenes almost every day the production was in production. So if the production is 100, 100 days, then they'll send a documentary crew out there for every day. Yeah. So they'd, you know, I'd come back and I'd literally be sitting overnight watching dailies, um, just doing telecine, you know, it's pretty amazing. So cut to after film school, I was, I was uh, approached to do another documentary for the same company. Um, and they were doing Hearts of Darkness. The making, yes. The oh, make, yeah. Yeah, the making. Saw it in the theater. The making of Apocalypse Now. Yeah. Um, because I had worked uh, with them doing some 16 millimeter work, uh, I knew the, I knew a chem, I knew a flatbed by you know like the back of my hand. I could sink dailies really really quickly. Um, they wanted somebody to come in and take a look at the Hearts of Darkness raw dailies, and just to see if it's viable. Like see if you know we, do we have to transfer it? Do we have to you know reconstitute all the trims? To like you know what condition is the, is this footage in? Because it's all on on 16 millimeter now. But what you know there's select reels. Somebody tried to you know, cut it in the mid '80s, and they didn't have any luck. This is all the, too, this is, the sorry. This is all the raw, raw behind the scenes raw, of apocalypse. Now that's correct. So no, that's no. got to be banana <laughs> pants right there. Totally. You know, and and one of the influences I had even before I went to film school was was apocalypse. Now that's one of my favorites. I mean, Storaro was absolutely one of my favorites. Yeah. You know? Um, the conformist and like just all of the, I mean, anything that Storaro has done. Um, yeah, he's all right. Yeah, he's okay. You know, <laughs> shot a thing or two. Him, him and Alan Davio, right. they're, they're all right. Uh, Alan Empire was the nominated for, for Empire of the Sun and it was, you know, an amazing experience that summer to watch him at work. You know, it's it's fantastic. And then to see how that footage was crafted into a scene and into the behind the scenes and stuff that was really fun to watch. So on Hearts of Darkness, I was tasked with um, sort of putting all this footage together and seeing, and it was supposed to be like a six week job, you know, and I was like just tucked away in like a trailer, you know, the back of the universal lot, like looking at all this footage going, this is fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. Nobody has seen this stuff since like, you know, Apocalypse Now, like, you know, maybe there was some other assistant who'd worked in the mid eighties trying to like gather all this stuff as they pulled some select reels together. And, you know, when working in 16, there's like, you know, edge numbers on them. So I'm like, literally it's like a piece of puzzle trying to put, you know, the selects back in the daily roll so that when we watch footage, it will be the raw dailies essentially. So, cause you know, there've been big chunks of it pulled out for whatever reason, or they thought it was boring, whatever, but no, 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 the filmmakers really wanted to see what was all there. So I put it all together. We started watching it and the filmmakers and, and I even, I mean, I was doing it before the filmmakers were coming. I was like, this is amazing. Amazing, amazing footage and they were asking like do you think there's a film here I said are you kidding me of course I mean let I mean there, there's all this amazing documentary footage but also all of the outtakes from apocalypse that no one's ever seen French plantation all yeah. this crazy stuff with Harvey Keitel that like all they had all these and they shot for something like six weeks or something did the Harvey Keitel or? stuff make it into Hearts of Darkness because I don't remember any of it no and I think the story that I've heard is that they never really got a release from Harvey Keitel so they mm. were not ever and the release on the feature would have covered the the documentary footage but they never found the paperwork so and he was not interested at that time to <laughs> have that work out there again yeah, he wasn't yeah. really all that bad he just was miscast in my opinion i think well what i heard and and you would know better is that the original John Milia script was way more like a Rambo actioner, actioner kind of thing. And Harvey Keitel back then was like all muscle bound, young and hunky guy. Right. And it made more sense to have him in that. That's what sure. I heard. That makes total sense. Yeah. And then I think once they started reali- once they started shooting, I think they realized that he wasn't quite the right person. He's incredibly yeah. talented. I mean, look at his other work. I mean, yeah, he's yeah. fantastic. I think he just was miscast in that. And you see scenes, like there were scenes originally cut, um, you know, the, the exterminate with extreme prejudice. Yeah. The scene, you know, the, the sort of classic scene where it's just sort of like, all right, here's what you need to do. When they shot it with Harvey Keitel, it was shot in a classroom. You know, I don't even know if anybody's ever seen this. I don't even know if it's in Redux or any other whatever. I don't think but any it's of like, it is. But there's a scene where they shot it and it's it's in a classroom. Most of the same characters are the same. It's just Harvey plays. Um, so Harvey Keitel is playing Willard. And they're, the scene takes place in a classroom. They're explaining the, the mission, whatever, on the classroom and it's kind of yeah. like a much more military. In any case, my impression was that Coppola was not happy with the performances. They may have want to also change the dialogue a little bit or just change the mood of it and the, the tone of it. And so when you see the scene now, it's t- it takes place around a, a dining room, like a table, right? They're all having a meal yeah. with like crawfish and shrimp and you know all this stuff. So it's like, it's a totally different tone and vibe. And it's like that Coppola was, uh, my impression was certainly that he had you know this ability to shoot all these scenes and see what works, what didn't work. And then to go back and reshoot them with Martin Sheen, it was pretty, it was night and day, but you realize what Martin brought to that character was just something, I don't know, it was was really interesting and dark. And, you know, he was in a little bit of a personal crisis and then also had the medical crisis during the filming and all this stuff. So it's sort of, 
you know, they all yep. kind of went up the river a little bit and they were like, you know, trying to find themselves in a way. So it's so it cut to this, you know, like a year and a half later and I'm still <laughs> on the film, still um, working as an assistant editor. They've asked me to shoot a number of inserts on the film because they knew I could shoot. They knew I wanted to shoot. I shot two interviews with a couple Playboy bunnies. So I got a camera operator credit, which is great. So I shot Sweet. a couple interviews. And I got uh, I was a camera assistant. We were shooting film back then. So it was loading. You know, I could load. Um, but I was working as an assistant editor uh, as well. So I have those three credits. It was fantastic. It was really like, I kind of consider it like a finishing school almost. I mean, because it, I ended up working, you know, again, as assistant editor, which the, the, the biggest part for me as a cinematographer, I was able to see, again, see these raw dailies, you know, see raw footage come from 1976 and then also see how they shoot an interview, it was working on set, you know, shooting and yeah. camera assisting the, edit, the, the, the interviews as well as working as the assistant and ha- helping the editors kind of craft these scenes and finding these inserts, finding this and finding that and seeing how all this footage comes comes together, see what was missing. You know, an editor was like, where's the shot of this? And I was like, well, uh, they didn't have it. So, you know, knowing, putting that in the back of my brain as a cinematographer, like, okay, if you shoot a scene like this, make sure you shoot an insert, you know, because the editor will call for it later. Um, so all of that stuff, that assistant editing stuff, really the post-production stuff, seeing that process of how a, something is shot and then crafted into a scene in the edit room was so incredibly valuable as a shooter later on. And it's it's like my finishing school. One other story I say is like, when we were starting to realize that we needed to include the French plantation in the, in the, in the project, I knew that nobody had ever seen those dailies. And I was watching, um, you know, 35 millimeter dailies. Uh, we had a 35 millimeter upright, movieola upright that we were watching our dailies on. <laughs> And nobody had seen, you know, there was literally dailies, you know, picture and sound, and I would roll them up, and I'd be watching these scenes and, like, taking notes, and, you know, I knew that nobody had ever seen the French plantation besides dailies, and nobody did negative, we found the negative, all that stuff. And I, I made an excuse, I said, well, I think somebody should talk to Vittorio about how this is supposed to look. Oh, wow. So, you know, and they were like, oh, why don't you call? I was like, really? <laughs> so, got his number, arranged it, you know, back then, it was like the pre-email or whatever, so I, you know, made arrangements with his assistant, and ended up talking to him, and he's sitting, I, I picture him sitting on some, you know, veranda of some Italian <laughs> villa or whatever, you know. But, you know, I talked to him and I was like, well, here, I'm, I'm so-and-so and explained the things. Oh, yes, I can't do, cannot wait. To, I'm not a, not doing an a, a impression of Vittorio, but he said, look, I can't wait to see the film. Tell me what you want to know. And I said, well, I want to know what the French plantation is supposed to look like. And he told me, it's like, it needs to be look, look much warmer than the jungle. I mean, this was intended to be this sort of warm kind of womb type thing. It's an escape. It's off the river. It's you know, it's it's off the boat. It's it's something like a a little bit of a dream, you know. And and uh, I can't specifically say I can't remember exactly the words he said, but it was warm and inviting, you know. And so whatever you do, and I said, well, do you want to see it? Do you want to you know, somehow can we send you a roll of film? He said, no, 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 I trust you. It's like you don't even know me, but I think at that point he was like he knew he had it was so <laughs> far, you know, it was, it was yeah. fifteen year previous dailies that he was like, I, I think you'll do a fine a fine job. And sure enough, we, you know, we, uh, I think he saw the film at Cannes and I, I got a note back through the filmmakers that he said, you know, Vittorio said he did good. So I was like, okay. Cause I went to the, you know, we went to color timing and we we're doing yeah. some, a lot of photochemical. We finished on film, you know, back in the day, this was 90, 90, 91. I think we were finishing and the film premiered at Cannes. Um, I worked again, talk about finishing school. I learned a lot about not getting too in the weeds in terms of tech, but you know, old school now, but pack title, Pacific title. They were the guys doing the, all the optical printing, all the subtitles. They were doing like the bond opening title sequences, all the stuff. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> it was fantastic to work with these old timers. And they were like, oh, Apocalypse Now, I remember doing the title sequence for this or, you know, doing the titles for this. Or that was really fun for me to be able to kind of, it was a nod to the past, but also a nod to the future. And, and it really, it's a pretty amazing experience. I look back and it's like, wow. Um, and, and that film know. is one of the best <clears throat> films about making, making a film, film. ever. Yeah. So another another interesting and as is this an editor one of the one of your tasks is also like to record VO to, mm-hmm. to use temporarily in the cut and we we're because we we're cutting film the, somebody would write me a piece of dialogue or you know we'd try to do at least once a week you know where I wouldn't be going and having to make burn the mag at universal and then get it coded it was just you didn't have a sweet setup like, like, like the one that we have right here no exactly yeah. no it was like full on you have to record it on a nagra and Ugh. then take the nagra to the universal sound department sound department printed it on a mag the mag gets striped with code and whatever color whatever t- you want it and then you bring it back you have to log it all because it's on how this like we you know do all un- this? i don't know how we did how it, did we have an, there weren't enough so hours <laughs> in the day to do all this so they would they would ask me to do this v- this voiceover and oftentimes it would be at the end of the week and i'm just so fucking tired and i'm just like just reading it like completely <laughs> Like, and so it would be like, um, you know, voiceover for, you know, explaining where we are, you know, and it was supposed to be sort of Ellie's, Eleanor, Mrs. Scopola's voice. And, uh, you know, it was like, well, yeah, you know, this is day 32 and Francis is, you know, coming down with a cold and yada, yada. Right. And then um, so my voice for probably over a year was in the film. 
And every time, every cut we'd show to Francis would be with my voice. And oftentimes, the the read I was giving was horrible. It was just, I was tired like, and kind of over it. Yeah. I was over it, right? Yeah. So I was just reading it just to get it. <laughs> and I wasn't reading it too fast or too slow because they would just get it in there and get it for timing. And people would get it and know eventually that they would they would replace it with somebody. They didn't really know how. But just the way that the workflow was, it's like Shauna records the, the VO and then <laughs> you take it to wherever and then it, cut, it gets cut in. So every cut that everybody always saw, including Francis, had my voice with sort of very, I was not an actor. Right before it was, we got into the Cannes Film Festival, right? So it was a big push to like the last three or four weeks of production um, to push to get this, the subtitles done because we had to subtitle it in French and all this other stuff. Get all the clips cleared, get all the, you know, whatever, get everything, all the tape to all the crazy stuff, all the clips from Apocalypse Now shrunk down from 235 to 185 and all this stuff and trying to make pan and scan decisions and talk about this color timing with Victoria oh, no. and all this stuff, right? And um, That's a handful. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was a lot of work. And in the process, they actually got a, a Michael Learned, who was Mrs. Walton, yeah. uh, to read the dialogue, read all of the stuff that I had. So they replaced all of my dialogue with Michael Learned, who was a very talented actress. You know, she was, again, Mrs. Walton. And she was originally cast as actually Kurtz's, Colonel Kurtz Brando's character's wife. Whoa. Um, in the movie. And there's a whole section, if you read Millie's script, there's a section where, and I don't know if they ever shot it, but it's written as Willard goes back to Kurtz's wife to say, you know, to report the news. I'm sorry, your, you know, your husband's been killed in action or whatever. And she supposedly asks Willard, did he speak of me? You know, what were his last words? Something like that. Um, and then Willard says all he said was the horror, the horror. So is he talking about the war? Is he talking about her? Is he talking mm-hmm. about whatever? But so Michael Learned certainly had for the fangirl or the fan, pe- you know, the fans, the, the serious fans would know that maybe they did shoot it or something. Maybe she did have a bit part or maybe they did shoot it. Somehow she was involved with the production. So maybe there was a, you know, a letter or some other voiceover that she read for the feature, the making of, you know, or an apocalypse now. So in any case, there was a little bit of a nod and Michael or Coppola wanted to use her and she, he suggested her. So they replaced all of my dialogue with Michael Learned's di- uh, voice. And the very first screening we had, it was probably about two weeks before Can. It was like supposed to be the final screening with the subtitles, everything, the final mix, Michael Learned's voice. Coppola's um, first comment after we saw the film and everybody's like super happy and Coppola <laughs> turned to the filmmakers. I was sitting right behind the filmmakers, you know, taking copious notes in case there was issues. And he said, well, what happened to the voiceover and I was like uh and I didn't say anything but they were like yeah that was actually temporary voiceover that was our assistant editor who's sitting right here Shauna and I was like hi and Coppola <laughs> couple's like it's all wrong Michael learned it's all wrong I, I want to put her back and I was like "Ooh!" for five seconds I was like you know like oh my god do I get residuals for this if I'm in the film do I like <laughs> am I gonna is this my career my new career about You're like a voiceover sad. artist or something yeah. whatever so for a couple of days they were actually really constant you know and they could easily have just slipped it back in because it was all cut and they were like gonna remix it and then they they talked it over and actually made the right decision, decision to actually have Eleanor Coppola, Mrs. Coppola, um, read all of her, uh, all of the dialogue. So it, it, it had come from her. And mm-hmm. also most of the dialogue was sort of based on her. She actually published a book called Notes about her diary, it's sort of basically um, copying her diary from the making of Apocalypse Now. She ended up recording all of the dialogue and they replaced her voice and she's the one in the final cut. So That's what I recall, yeah. For Maybe that's my worst story, I don't know. But um, that's not ha- anything to do with my cinematography. But, um, but for a few minutes, a few few days that is I was actually going to be the narrator on Hearts of Darkness but it didn't work out but and <laughs> in the end actually Eleanor did a fantastic job and it's it's perfect because it's it it's personal it yeah, became yeah. personal it's her journey and her film essentially about watching her her husband maybe go up, go up the river a little bit and go a little crazy and and uh, how he came out the other side, kind of a better, uh, better person. So I, I feel like it feeds into Terry Gilliam talks about this. How in every time he makes a movie, his life takes on the char- the arc of the main character. Absolutely. And Apocalypse <laughs> Now is like a cautionary tale of that because you watching that you see Coppola completely, like you said, go up the river. Like yeah. he 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 goes into his own heart of darkness. Yeah. Over the course of that, it's almost too perfect. Yeah. So you were working at Zotrope, and I feel like that's that's like a world that sounds mystical to me that you were, were were you working at Zoetrope or were you working just for them somewhere else? So um, the beginning of the project Hearts of Darkness uh, was, yes, definitely there were times when I would literally I drove a big truck up to Zotrope and brought the footage down to mm-hmm. to um, a company called ZM Productions. That's the same one I interned for when I was in um, college. And that's in San Francisco. ZM Zotrope is in San Francisco. ZM yeah. um, was on the Universal lot. It was ba- ba- basically behind Amblin's because they had, were attached to Spielberg's company. Oh, okay. And they did all of the behind the scenes for Amblin. So I think because of that connection, certainly uh, Coppola felt confident enough with the guys to you know uh, take a look at some of this footage. 
Uh, yes, so I went up to Zotrope, uh, dug through some archives. It was pretty amazing where all this footage was. Uh, There's some in like you know, the closet in the personal house. There was footage we sh- we found with Les Blank, who was a documentary filmmaker who shot Francis's 40th birthday. Uh, there was mostly the footage in the archives. There was some in the building, the Kearney and Columbus building, the, the Zotrope building in San Francisco. There was yeah. footage there. And then we brought it all down to Los Angeles. So we could sort of spread it out and kind of get it all in a bunch. Finding the negative on Apocalypse was it was another search. There was some in a salt mine in like Pennsylvania or something, what? you know, where they store a lot of uh, negatives. There was some in a open... negatives are never archived well. Somebody no, I, I had uh, I once met at this place called Lowry Digital, I think, and they do restoration. Sure. Or I don't know if they're still around. This is several years ago, but they were talking about they were doing a restoration of Titanic, and they were wow. talking about the the state in which the Titanic negative, you know, which at the time was the highest grossing movie of all time, sure. was just like in a ramshackle box in uh you know in an archive somewhere, like not organized, not right. clearly marked, and right. it was just bananas. Like right. they had to kind of re-edit Titanic. Well, the same thing with the Apocalypse Daily negative. The studio, I'll say, Zotrope and the studio had made an arrangement to have the the cut negative for the eight or nine reels that the film was in deep storage. So that was that was somewhat safe. It was the Daily's negative. So we wanted to look at French Plantation, at the Marlon Brando outtakes, um, you know, other footage, other scenes from the film, you know, the Harvey Keitel stuff that we ended up not not being able to use. But all the Daily's, the the Daily's work print and and audio, that was one thing. But also the negative from some of the stuff that we ended up wanting to use. Um, it was very much of a, of a search. There were a couple things, actually. Some of the Marlon Brando takes outtakes, we couldn't find the original negative. So there was theories you know, in the edit room about, like, did somebody come and steal it or did uh-huh. they want it for their own thing? But we ended up having when to... When he ate the bug, like, did, did, did you guys have the negative We had the he, negative for that, yeah. That but there's was, a couple in the classic. end sequence of uh, Classic of Brando. That. It's just, it's an amazing moment, you know? Yeah. Um, and he was in, so in character in that in that time. And then the, the lighting effect that they had, it was like, um, it was just, it was, it was a fantastic film. Anyway, being able to find some of that negative we were like digging around the vaults of Pacific Title. There was like a downtown warehouse where the guys literally there's like negatives from who knows how many other like daily, neg- you know, daily's negative from Apocalypse and a number of other features. Um, and when we drove up the first time, the guys were having a barbecue. The, the, the big storm barn, you know, whatever, the big giant um, roll up door was open. You know, there's millions of feet of film, right? And mm-hmm. including the Apocalypse negative. And they're having a barbecue with like the smoke was like, you know, billowing into the building. And we're like, Obviously, this stuff needs to a be rescued and b be like well, be located, but also be rescued and, and cataloged and then properly stored. So that was also part of our job is to find some of this stuff. And it, I think uh, the powers that be uh, realized the value of the negative, the value of the dailies negative. So after the film, um, we located everything as much as we could, certainly. And then now um, he actually hired an archivist, uh, and all the footage now is is completely safe and archived yeah. in a in a personal building. Actually, he built um, that's cl- climate and temperature controlled and all of that. So, um, but finding this, the, the, finding the negative was just definitely a needle in the haystack. But um, but also a, certainly a lesson in like. Uh, uh, motion picture history you know we were looking at Italian most of it the, the crew was Italian the camera crew was all Italian because mm-hmm. of Vittorio, Vittorio's crew right in the Philippines so we had Philippine Tagalog uh, logs as well as like logs in Tagalog and then you know in, and then also logs in Italian camera roll logs and fortunately we were able to find the original one of the copies of the original shooting script continuity script so we could see you know but it's just it's fan- a fantastic collection of like cinema history like in my edit room which was like incredible to see like notes about like this is Vittorio's favorite take or this is you know this is why yeah, yeah. you know this should be you know pu- push to stop or pull to stop and you know just again it's a fantastic finishing school for me so i could talk on and on about hearts of darkness for a long time i appreciated the opportunity to be able to again observe the sort of process of a documentary being made observe how apocalypse now was made have connections with with the coppola family um the archivist who i'm still actually great friends with you know some of the people that we worked that on the film um strangely enough coincidentally on survivor the editor, one of the editors on Hearts of Darkness actually cut my seasons of Survivor. So it was a weird kind of like coming, oh, wow. to coming together full circle. But, but it was a fantastic experience. And, well, and again, one of the one of my favorite films about the making of a film. Well, let me ask you this too, and I may be reading too much into it, but Apocalypse Now wasn't made in a, in a very conventional way, the way most movies are made. And I almost feel like there is kind of a documentary feel to the way the movie was made, the way that Dennis Hopper's character was and Marlon Brando's character was. Now, you go on after that to become a documentary cinematographer primarily did anything about apocalypse now and digging through that footage when you were an assistant editor on hearts of darkness inform sort of how how your documentary career progressed it might not have or also like inform 
when you when you do work on uh, narrative stuff, how formative was Apocalypse Now and Hearts of Darkness for you in that regard? That's a big question because definitely Apocalypse Now is one of the first films I remember seeing and realizing it's very clear what a cinematographer does. You know, that one shot in particular of uh, Martin Sheen at the very end of the film coming out of the of the water. Holy crap. I mean, you know, there's like, you know, it's the doors, the end. It's like, you know, the, so good. the strobe lights and everything. It's the iconic image of him chills. in full. I know I'm getting chills too, but the full, you know, the full warm, you know, uh, the full, his makeup and like the, the camo. wet hair and the camo, yeah. yeah, the camo makeup and everything. And he's rising out of the water. I remember that shot distinctly seeing that in a, in a theater. I also remember Blade Runner and there's a few others in the late 70s, early 80s that were very, very pivotal and formative for me. And then I realized what the role of a cinematographer does. And I was like, I this, I get it. I get it. I maybe wanted to aspire. I felt like it was like way out of my reach, but I felt I, I was clear, I had a clear understanding of what a cinematographer did from, you know, Cronenworth's work in Blade Runner and even John Seale in Witness and, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, Storaro and, and Apocalypse Now, those were the three that were sort of my formative ones, really understanding what a cinematographer does. Um, where am I going with this? Oh, so you asked how Apocalypse Now certainly informs my work. I think the certain attention to detail and the in, the intention of almost every shot in that film, there's a very clear, there's not really any much wasted, like, Stuff. Everything's clear and intended to tell you something. Each frame, each composition, each scene, there's something that you're learning about a character or a sense of place or something. So that, that intention was very informative. And I, I try to do that in my own work, um, actually. Uh, it's sort of maybe an unintended result of, of watching a number of movies that I that I enjoy and kind of trying to summarize why I like them. But I, I do, in my own work, I, I, I try to shoot in a way that um, the, the things that I'm shooting, the people I'm shooting, the stories I'm telling, every image or every series of images has a clear intention. Um, so that in that one regard, I, I feel there's definitely an influence. But I think the biggest influence for me, particularly on Hearts of Darkness, and the, um, participating in and watching uh, the process of how a documentary is made. So there's twofold, actually. How a film, is, a feature film is made was incredibly educational for me. Um, and it certainly informed my work about how maybe not to act on a certain <laughs> estate, you know, a certain film set. I mean, also you're right that there was a certain documentary aspect to a lot of the, say, again, the scene we're talking about with Brando and the well, it's butchering very improvisational. Of the, I mean, like the, you know, the butchering of the water buffalo that was all Oof. real and completely graphic, but shot in a documentary way with two or three cameras, and you know, they were trusting the operators to kind of get and feel what what they could. Um, certainly, in in tandem with Storaro lighting it in a in a very dramatic way, so there was a sort of improvisational documentary approach to some scenes in the film, which definitely were were uh, you know made a, a deep impression to me. But the process of making um, Hearts of Darkness allowed me in later years to realize again what how a doc is made from raw footage you know that you've got all different elements in a documentary that you could use and in that case there was feature film there was unseen you know dialogue there was new interviews there was footage that was shot there's just a lot of different maps and inserts you know i shot a lot of inserts of of a uh, little the sn the nagra sn the little spy they call it a spy nagra it's i remember that you know, yeah i remember, remember those shots. like yeah. yeah and um and then there's like the maps and this and that and and so all of those pieces seeing those cut together and seeing what made it, what didn't make it, what was used to great effect, what was you know um, seemingly se- mundane, but then seeing how it was cut together in the film, um, really informs my work. Those were my formative years as a documentary shooter. So to be able to kind of uh, again observe the sort of these daily, you know, there's these amazing cinematographers shoot shoot these National Geographic and Hearts of Darkness and you know the making of these other films really informed my work later on. And I think even today, I, I'm constantly thinking about you know, don't forget to shoot that insert. <laughs> don't forget to shoot. I do that every day. Make a like, list. And I'm, is there a good app for that? Is there a good app that reminds you? <laughs> it's uh, it's in you know, it's certainly ingrained in me yeah. now in the brain. You know, start with a wide. Often I start with a wide and I go in, or I'll end with a wide. And I'm constantly thinking about a beginning, middle, and end of a scene, and thinking in terms of editing. How will an editor or cut the story together you know because a, a scene could be fantastic but if you stay on a two shot it's like uh, how, yeah. are they, how are they going to cut it you know it's you need to kind of be a, be aware of uh, how you want a scene to play out and and you know you're you're along you know you want to bring the audience along for the ride i mean if you're a person in a room you're you're not watching just everybody you're like looking at Ilya, you know typing on the thing you're looking at the kind of thing there's inserts that yeah. you, your brain you're sort of observing so thinking about 
that and thinking about approaching a scene in that way what interests you and how do you tell the story visually and then get certainly get all the things that an editor would need to to cut the scene together it's interesting how the post-production work really does inform my work i mean hearts of darkness is definitely an influence um and I, i'm still really good friends with a lot of the, most of the people that worked on that film because um, it was such an intense experience for all of us i mean we felt like you know we were so sort of deep in the river or deep down the river far <laughs> in the, we were so far down the river we ourselves, should make you know, a so like, documentary called hearts of hearts of darkness <laughs> where we make a do- where we talk about you guys making it and how madness inducing that was we we did a little we have some stills we did a little crazy like you know back in the day we i think we shot in you know, any time i had like a extra you know mm-hmm. few feet of film i'd roll a little bit in the edit room or something <laughs> so somewhere somewhere in some deep storage is uh is some goofy footage but that's <laughs> that's for another day but um but it was great it's fantastic every time i mention that film somebody always has a story and it's always it's great it's it was it was great so I think that's a great place for us to stop. Where can people find your work online if they want to see it? Well, thank you for having me. It's been it's been amazing and a great conversation. Thank we'll you so much. We'll have you back. Yeah. I have a website. It's shaunahagan.com. It's S-H-A-N-A-H-A-G-A-N.com. Mm-hmm. Also, I'm on Instagram at, at shagandp. That's S-H-A-G-A-N-D-P. Everyone subscribe, please. Yes. Um, that's me. That's it. I mean, I'm, that's the only two I do. So <laughs> I, I have trouble keeping up with social media. I mean, I use it certainly to, to um, disseminate information, tell people oh, yeah. about screenings and such, but uh, that's it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on here. We'd love to have you back sometime. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. All right. So that was Shauna Hagen. Shauna, sorry it took us uh, 9,000 years to to release your episode. It, it, it was a long time, but I think it was worth it. I think it was a great interview. It's an awesome. It, it was really great to meet her and uh, and to talk to her. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of her work. And what a small world. I knew her. Alicia knew her. Everybody around you seemed to know Shauna. And now you do, too. Yes. Now, now, now we're old friends. <laughs> Because it was so long ago. <laughs> it, 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 well, it was. It was. Uh, we're almost e- done. With, we're almost EK done with the vault. We're almost kids. <laughs> we're almost done with the vault of people who we interviewed. Uh, we're, we're chipping away at it, and uh, and then afterwards, oh my God, do we have some amazing ones coming up? Oh, so, we do some really good stuff. I'm so excited about one we just recorded a couple days ago. <laughs> spoilers, spoilers, not, Ben. I didn't, I didn't say who it was. Oh, okay, but uh, it's someone who we've been trying to get on the show for a while. So it was a bucket list person. If you go back and listen to every episode, which you should do, You'll, you will be able to figure it out. Because more than once, I've been like, if only this person will come on, my life will be complete. And I'm going to tell you right now, after that interview, my life is complete. This whoa. person was amazing. Boom. I'm okay. I'm. So, it's one of my favorite cinematographers. I'm so glad that I was able to talk to this person. Uh, I'm so I'm so glad too, and and the show is happy for it as well. Right. Ben, you know what time it is? It, I think it's time to pay some bills. T- paying the bill time. That's right. Uh, we have to thank our wonderful sponsor, Aerie. Uh, Aerie has a really really cool thing. Aerie has a little lamb. Aerie has a little lamb. No, Aerie oh, no, has. <laughs> Good, good night, Iris Rods. Oh, good man. night, Matt Box. <laughs> good night. <laughs> well, come on, you got you got one more in there. <laughs> I will totally use Airy cameras to make my uh, adaptation of Good Night Moon, which will be a horror movie. Oh, God. It'll be the most terrifying thing that has ever been seen by human eyes. As I was trying to pay these bills here, uh, Airy uh, on the Airy channel on YouTube, actually just uh, about a week or so ago, put up their new Airy camera stabilizer system showreel. Which is awesome. You should totally uh, check it out. Uh, part of that I, system. I second that. I was watching it over Elias' shoulder. Yeah, it, it, part of that system is something called the SRH3, which is their stabilized remote head, and it's incredible. It's a, it's a like a gimbal, I would say, for like a, I'm trying to put this into lay terms, but essentially it's a remote control head that uh, is stabilized, so it doesn't mm. show shake and shimmy and all that other sort of stuff, and it can have an incredible Sheer weight capacity. Pitch, yeah, roll. It, all, all all those things it's p- part of what they call a, a, a trinity package this um this system uh, basically allows people to run around with the cameras large airy cameras including even the alexa 65 and get incredibly smooth stabilized shots and at the very least even if you think hey i'm not going to own this thing go watch the showreel the showreel has nice split screens which shows how they did some of the stuff while at the same time seeing what exactly they shot, and it's it's fantastic. You'll be all shut up and take my money right after that. Did they name it uh, the Trinity uh, system after Trinity from the Matrix movie, who could who could jump in the air and be completely smoothly held aloft as the camera rotated around her? I'm gonna say no, but that would be awesome if they did. I, I, that's what I hope. <laughs> no, I, I'm sure that, I'm sure it was not. <laughs> <laughs> 
And now, short ends. Ben, I think we've reached the short end time All for the right. show. All right. So uh, you want to dive in? You want me to dive in? What I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think you and I might have talked about this briefly when we were talking about Corridor Crew mm. in a previous episode. And um, I, I fell down another YouTube rabbit hole and it's a channel called Control Shift Face. And it's uh, a uh, somebody who is experimenting with uh, deep fakes. And they're doing some pretty amazing stuff that's making me like, I mean, I think deep fakes are going to become just a tool in our toolbox pretty soon if they aren't there already. So this person, a lot of people probably saw a video where they put Jim Carrey's face on Jack Nicholson in The Shining. Hmm. And uh, then scary. Then the same person uh, put um, Bruce Lee's face on Keanu Reeves face in uh, The Matrix. Wow. And it's pretty cool. And then the newest one that I just saw literally yesterday was Tom Cruise's face on Christian Bale in American Psycho. And I remember seeing American Psycho and I knew who Christian Bale was, but I was like, damn, he looks a lot like Tom Cruise. But he could have looked more like Tom Cruise. And now I know why. It's it's pretty amazing. He's he's uh, this is also the person who like uh, I, Bill Hader was on, I think, Conan and he, and they had him uh, have they turned his face into Schwarzenegger's face. And they I think they did the same thing with Al Pacino and, uh, you know, deep faking. Like I didn't really understand what it was, but looking into it, it's basically uh, an, an AI algorithm that like you feed a lot of video into um into it of of one person so like let's say you have tom cruise and you have him under different lighting and you have him in a bunch of different circumstances and so it learns where his teeth are and his eyebrows and everything like that so you're basically using the one performance and then it is computer generating and lighting and very realistically creating the other person's face in the scene and it's what's interesting is it's like you'll see little highlights uh catching you know in 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 the in the case of uh the American Psycho thing, you'll see little highlights hitting a piece of Tom Cruise's nose or lip that are not hitting Christian Bale's if you look at it side by side. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I feel like this technique is probably something that's going to come in very handy for things like stunt performances because you're just not going to be able to tell anymore. Like, you know, you, you get a stunt man who has the appro- uh, approximate built stunt man or a woman who has the approximate build of the performer that they're doing the stunt for. And then you could literally deep fake that actor's face on them so that it looks like they really, really did whatever it was. It's, it's, uh, I, I know it's sort of in its infancy, but, uh, well, this is, it might be in its infancy, but this is the, the second short end basically. Cause we talked, you talked about the, the, um, Oh yeah. The Tom Cruise impersonator that they brought yeah, on with, too. for the, uh, the corridor digital quarter yeah, crew, quarter yeah. crew. Yeah. They, they brought in a Tom Cruise impersonator and that was them learning how to use the deep fake, uh, program, I guess. And it's it's just freaky because I think it's freaky because it's putting someone who was not there into the same lighting. Like to me, that's what's that's the weirdest thing of all is that it's figuring out what the light would look like if it was hitting objects that weren't there. Like everything about it is is bananas. But I but again, I I, I think that it's one of those things that probably our eyes are going to like the first time we we ever saw CGI. You know, we were like, oh, no, the world is over. They can fake anything. And now you look back at, you know, uh, Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park, Apollo 13, Terminator 2. And you're like, yeah, it's yeah, quaint. It, it <laughs> looks good for yeah. what for for its year, but it doesn't fool me now. And I feel like deep fakes are probably gonna be like that. We're going to we're going to start to see telltale signs. Yeah, but for sure. But it's still pretty cool. So it's tip of the iceberg, though, too. I mean, they're, they're deep faking audio. They're deep faking all kinds of stuff now, too. It's like yeah. uh, they, the the future will not be boring. And uh, undoubtedly, we're going to run into uh, more and more fake news that now has fake video. To yeah, go you're just that. not going to be able to trust anything. Yeah. I mean, I, I really think it's going to go back to curation. But like, I, I mean, not not to get all weird and political about it, but like I have a movie that I, as you know, that I've been trying to get off the ground for a long time. And one of the main characters is a baby. And there, I've talked to a bunch of producers about how you do it. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, I, bet, deep fake the I baby. bet you could deep fake the baby. I bet you, you get like your main baby actor and you take a bazillion pictures of that baby reacting and doing stuff in different light. And then you might be able to swap out relatively similar looking babies or babies that are about the same size and just deep fake the hell out of that face. Hmm. You, it's entirely possible or maybe the baby is asleep in the scene and you need the baby to be awake or vice versa 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just think, uh, I mean, well, for, for that to work, you really do need, you need the underlying performance to come from somewhere. So you would need a baby that was awake. And so you'd have, you know. Sure. But but yeah, you, you get my point. I've, yeah. I don't know. I haven't tried to use the software that does it yet. But um, but I, I, I think that there are things that it will enable people to do that they don't even imagine. And, and you know, we haven't even gotten to what we can do with uh, deep faking dogs. Anyway, uh, so what is your short end? Oh, my God. My, so my short follow end. Follow deep faking dogs. Yeah, fo- follow that. Um, uh, my short end obsession is going to ra- uh, wander a little bit here. But basically, my streaming platform provider where I'm enjoying all kinds of um, uh, pay-per-view style television and TV series and things like that, Amazon Prime, is actually now where I am buying toothpaste in person because I don't think that Whole Foods should in, in owned by Amazon uh, along with Audible owned by Amazon. They, the Amazon now, I don't know when they get so big that they Don't get, bad mouth Audible. I might oh. be working for them. <laughs> I don't know when they get so big that someone splits them up because I, I swear I went in to buy toothpaste and some coconut water and some other stuff inside the store. And as I'm going in there, the Burbank Whole Foods, which I should just call Burbank Amazon, uh, is marvelous Mrs. Maisel everywhere. So remember when you said I was like the stereotypical California guy because I was talking about meditation, which yeah. anyone can do in the whole world? Yeah, yeah. You're talking about the Burbank Whole Foods. That's right. I just want to... No, no. Underline. It's the Burbank Amazon now is what I'm saying. I just want to triple underline that. Yeah, you, you can triple underline that all you want, but I went in there and it is Amazon. I walk in there and it's for your consideration. Giant parking spots that say like, have marvelous parking here at, here at Whole Foods, which should be Amazon. I, I mean, that is a great television show. It is a great television show shot by a very talented DV. DP too. And it's like a, who hasn't been on the show yet, but, but, but we'll be here someday. Soon. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it is Amazon. I'm in there and I'm surrounded by Amazon prime surrounded by, uh, ads for, for my consideration, Amazon shows everything about whole foods is Amazon. And where mm-hmm. does Amazon s- stop? It's like a- Amazon already accounts for 50% of all online transactions. I mean, uh-huh. I, I it, it is now where I watch my television shows, where I buy my toothpaste, where <laughs> my grocery store is owned by America Online. Go on. <laughs> Every time I go to open the door, I hear that that sound of it logging. <laughs> You've <in>. got mail. <laughs> uh, anyway, so so my short end is is weird. It's the the internet, the internet, and my television uh, entertainment system is now a physical manifestation in the world that I live, and it's where I can buy groceries and cleaning products. This is to me. It's think, like think of it this way. I choose to not think of it, uh, of it as Whole Foods is where uh, people go to buy homeopathy. That's idiotic magic water made by uh, made by mystics for. Tell me what you really think for, for people to get rid of their headaches. I prefer to think you might buy soap there. You might buy toothpaste. I, you might buy coconut water. Come I, on, I, I've never bought coconut water. <laughs> uh, but, but boy, uh, yeah, you you'll I'll have to pry a can of Lacroix out of your cold I, dead I, hands. I do I do enjoy Lacroix. No, but uh, but think about it this way. Okay, I'm thinking. Uh, I'm just going to turn this around on it. Turn it, turn it around. So your your overpriced toothpaste and coconut water, yeah, is paying to make, in some cases, some of the best television being made today. See, I don't buy that argument because and, and Amazon existed and was doing that before they acquired the grocery store. Sure. I, but I, it seems like okay. It was a completely separate entity, se- separate revenue stream, and now Amazon has Amazoned up Whole Foods to the point where it's not Whole Foods well, anymore. Whole Foods was like owned by some. I don't want to get into the politics of the guy, <laughs> but like somebody who like really didn't think workers had rights and was kind of a creep. And I'm, is oh, that different from Amazon? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We're getting political now. I, so much for that Amazon sponsorship. That, would, that just went out the window. I would love to <laughs> not say anything. I, I, I mean, I love me some Amazon, and I think that they've. Uh, the only, the only thing I really disagree with them about is they canceled the Tick. Loved that show. Oh yeah. All right. But, uh, but I got two good seasons of the Tick out of them. So uh, no, but and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel is a great show, and I have to think that some of your money that's going into uh, w- what has always been an overpriced uh, adventure at Whole Foods. An overpriced adventure with a crappy parking lot, like the, it's it's just like Trader Joe's. They 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 by design have the worst parking lots ever. I don't mean to take uh, umbrage with you here regarding the parking lot, but you've not been to the Burbank Amazon. I'm taking it. I take it then, because there is no problem with that parking lot. It, it's Whole Foods still, right? Or did they start calling it Amazon? Oh, I'm gonna, just going to call it Amazon. Okay, from fine. here on out, it's it's um, just it's the Amazon store. 
Uh, that's fine. I have not because uh, I uh, honestly will do anything in my power to avoid setting foot in a Whole Foods. It's a, it's a masterpiece of parking. But yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to support 50% of all internet dollars going to a giant multi-billion dollar corporation that is um, also selling me toothpaste. Yeah, I just never liked Whole Foods. <laughs> all right. So and, and, uh, they, and they sell homeopathy. I mean, like I, I used to do this. So, this so that's is, why you don't like them. This has nothing to do with cinematography. What? I, used, I used to when I would find myself stuck in a Whole Foods, I would go into the homeopathy aisle and then I would find the nearest unfortunate employee and ask them questions. I'd be like, why is there poison ivy in this skin cream? Because it says it on the skin cream. And it's like, that's how homeopathy yeah. does what it does. Yeah, it's like they don't know about that it's diluted past the point of Avogadro's constant. They don't know any of that stuff. Have you seen the video? It's getting real in the Whole Foods parking lot. No. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's your homework. You, from between now and our next episode, you have to go watch It's Getting Real in the Whole Foods parking lot. All right. I will do it. All right, Ben, I think this is uh, the end of the show. Where and can- we've lost everyone with all this. Yeah, there's no authors. way that anyone listened to this. We're going to have an if, episode. If, if you've made it this far, <laughs> email uh, Ilya and he will have a T-shirt waiting for you when you show up. So, Ilya, now that we've lost everyone with all this discussion of Whole Foods, uh, where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. Uh, you can find me at Neptune Salad on the Twitters. Uh, you can find me uh, at www, that means World Wide Web. Does it? Yes, it does. Uh, .benrockonline.com. And if you're really excited about uh, about cool things that are fun, keep an eye on 20secondstolive.com because a second season is coming soon. So who do we need to thank, Ilya? Nobody. I'd like to thank nobody for all the work that we didn't do. Uh, we got to thank our editorial staff. Let's start off with them. We got to thank Ben and Abby for doing a kick butt job and keeping us, uh, keeping us. I, I going. think I mentioned that when we were uh, doing the, the live interview with Checo Varese, I got to, I got to actually meet Ben Katz. Was that nice? Super cool guy. Yeah, that was, that was great. Yes. Uh, I guess we should thank Alana Cody then too. That of course. Would, that would be awkward. Who is not only kicking all the ass on this show, but is also keeping both of our feet to the flames. And I, and I think that we have literally doubled the number of episodes or more than doubled the number of episodes that we've released since she came on board, what, a year and a half ago? Yeah. We've been exactly. doing this for like five years. Six. Almost. Oh my God. Can really? you believe it? I know. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it was wasted time. Yeah. You've had fun. A couple of laughs. Yeah. No, totally. Got to meet several of my actual heroes. So, and then last. And, and now your life is complete too because of this last interview. The last interview, I'm telling you, and I will, I, I think people will know it when I introduce it. It's it, definitely a bucket list item well, above many others. All right. And no offense to all the other brilliant geniuses we've had on here, but this is just someone whose work I've been tracking since like maybe my first year of film school. Wow. So, anyway, last, lastly, we need to thank Kay's Alatrachi, who is not listening to the nope, sound of my d- voice. Doesn't hear us. Thank him. Um, but yeah. you can uh, you can hire him at musicbykays.com. And he actually just recently launched a, a website for his directing reel. And he's producing a feature now, too. So it's like that guy. What I, the fuck? I, I mean, I totally expect next time I see him or I talk to him on the phone, he's going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm conducting a train right now. Like, yeah. I, I got tired with, like, conducting live orchestra. So now I'm conducting a train. Like, hey, guys, I started a cinematography podcast <laughs> and, and I got Roger Deakins on as my first guest. <laughs> Uh, hey, you know what, uh, fellas? Uh, I, I'm in med school now. Uh, it turns out I'm going to be a surgeon. It's like I'm going to do brain surgery on rocket ships. Okay, oh, <laughs> I, I can't wait to see what you do next. <laughs> you're just you're just a uh, a bunch of surprises, Kays. Anyway, uh, thank you all for listening to episode forty fucking two. If you got this far, thank you very much, and we will see you at episode forty goddamn three very soon. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.